and we are hold on. we are live all right thanks for joining us everybody for an evening of aquaponics that is me, Peter Severi, Future Cannabis Project, and I am going to pass the mic off to Steve Raisner. So, Steve, take it away. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Peter. It's, I haven't seen you since, uh, I guess it was, was it uh, Dragonflies thing, or was it at, at the Emerald, or no, the uh, Regen, Regen? It was, uh, yeah, up in Humboldt. Yeah, awesome. At the Dragonfly, um, our Dragonfly getaway. Oh yeah. Uh, well, thanks for having me on. Um, today we've assembled a, a whole wide range of different commercial aquaponic cannabis producers. Uh, we have a, a quite a diverse range of different um, methodologies and ideologies on how to approach the problem. And uh, but all of us are, are successful. Uh, have companies that are um, or are head growers of companies that are uh, you know leading the way in, in their particular areas. So. Uh, we thought it'd be really cool to have everyone on and let educate people more about the topic and uh, just the diversity that we have even within our own community. Uh, so uh, we have um, uh, Tanner Stewart from Stewart Farms. How you doing? <laughs> we have uh, Bain Howard from Vertica. Hey everybody, thanks for having me. Uh, we have uh, Le Leanne, our chief cultivator from uh, Habitat Life. Hey guys, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Lane. Um, and then uh, uh, we also have Marty of uh, AP Meds. He also is the my co-host over on the Growing with Fishes podcast. How's it going, everybody? All right. So uh, we thought we'd first jump right into it. Um, uh, first off, uh, what is your uh, methodology on uh, growing aquaponics, and um, uh, you know how do you have your your stuff set up? So I guess we'll uh, we'll let um, uh, Bain go first, and then we'll we'll go on to uh, to Tanner. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm located here in I guess southeastern Oklahoma. Um, I actually really recently just took over this farm a few months ago, and the currently the methods we're using at the farm, we've got some plants going in deep water culture, and that's primarily our moms that we're growing up, vegging and taking clones off of. And then we're starting to phase in some more dual root zone into that uh, system, but that's a work in progress. We're still building on that. So currently everything's vegged in the AP pools and the uh, deep water culture. Then we transplant that, bring it out into pots, into containers, and then veg it up for a little while, get it used to the transition, and then take it and flower it from there with our AP water and then we make a few little amendments onto that before it goes onto the flowering plants. So that's kind of the the quick and dirty of I guess how they move through our farm and we're kind of using a whole conglomerate a bunch of different methods right now but it's uh it's working for us. All right uh, Tanner why don't you tell us about your farm? <clears throat> yeah so um so I, I I've been uh in the uh, indoor vertical aquaponics farming game for about six years here now and and uh, originally my background comes out of a, a nutrient film technique format of uh, aquaponics farming so I uh, uh, did closed loop um, uh, completely coupled closed loop system for about three years uh, in the uh, leafy green realm with spinach kale arugula uh, swiss chards you know uh, pretty much the leafy green world so uh, there we practice nutrient film technique on a completely closed loop system. So that's where we got where I kind of came from uh, at a food. But now as we uh, move into the aquaponics realm uh, within cannabis here, we're, we're located in uh, uh, St. Stephen, New Brunswick here, right on the uh, right on the border of Calais, Maine. It's kind of a kind of a cool little cool little town here that uh, you look you look up across the river and uh, you're looking right at the United States. So. Uh, we're we're looking forward to when we do some outdoor grow and the smell of our weed blows across the uh, the border there. Uh, eventually, <laughs> sorry, I got on a tangent, but uh, <laughs> but yeah. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, are now moving into a, a living soil uh, system. So we're starting out living soil uh, fed by our uh, uh, tilapia 
system, we're actually doing a, uh, a top feed irrigation uh, system. And then as we progress forward, we're really going to be examining, uh, you know, what's what's going on with the living soil, only aquaculture, nutrient base, then transitioning, uh, looking at a dual root zone uh, system. And then also we're going to be uh, digging into the some more of the comparisons on uh, on deep water uh, cultures. So we're we're gonna follow, follow a little bit of uh, uh, your path, uh, Steve, uh, as well through, throughout our uh, journey here as we uh, launch our initial uh, uh, flower at the door. Awesome, and you and uh, you and the end both of uh, a vertical type farms, correct? Yeah. So uh, so yeah. So I, everything uh, everything we're doing is. Uh, uh, you know, going to be ending up in a five-story fully automated vertical farm. Uh, so everything we're doing right now uh, on phase one uh, is all really a data point to feed in to exactly what we're going to do on that next uh, automated vertical module and, and platforming, of course, from, uh, you know, uh, the, the about five years I was with uh, you know, in my previous endeavor doing doing a 12 story vertical, not automated, uh, you gotta be automated. Uh, you need to be automated. <laughs> That's one of the rules in vertical farming. Uh, get a robot and have it move the plants around, so. <laughs> and uh, and Leanne, I understand you have a quite a nice uh, vertical farm. I know uh, you sent me quite a few nice pictures. Uh, tell us about how you're set up. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. So uh, me and the Habitat crew, we have a, uh, micro cultivation facility out in Chase, BC. We use a uh, coho salmon as our fish species and we are a soilless facility. So the way it works is uh, all the water from the salmon is going into our water treatment room. There it's going through a digester that then we end up uh, sending to our cannabis plants. Very cool, and you do vertical uh, racking as well, correct? Correct. So uh, right now, now in our setup, we have uh, two levels high and we have the middle open up. So we're just going up on scaffolding to look after the top racks at the moment. All right. Um, and uh, Marty, tell us about your grow and uh, how you're set up. Uh, well, I, I used to have a, a medical grow here in Southern Oregon. Um, then after legalization, I got shut down and had to move again. So I'm just getting set up again here. Um, I got a test system online and I'm working on building out a design that I can replicate for medical growers in Oregon that all want to you know, run their 48 plant count and try to make something that's a little, uh, a little cookie cutter, if you will, and uh, put that together and be able to, to do that. And so just getting ready to finish the first harvest on that. and. Uh, yeah, pretty excited about that. I, I run just a uh, koi and uh, and goldfish, so not, nothing fancy on the fish side. They're they're pretty much just uh, nutrient machines and and uh, micro cultures on on my end. Awesome. So um, uh, a lot of uh, how many of you guys here have actually grown uh, with other methods that aren't aquaponics? Oh yeah, for sure. Living soil, subirrigated planters. Uh, yeah, just pots, um, <laughs> num a number of different ways, allegedly, earlier in my career. <laughs> uh, I actually got started doing uh, veggies and did quite a bit. We, we ran the first farm I was ever a part of, had a little bit of aquaponics. I was doing deep water culture lettuce, and then we had about a half acre out back that we would do kind of your living soil, uh, no-till kind of organic cultivation, just grow crops and we'd do corn and cabbages and kale and, you know, kind of whatever was seasonal. And then we ran door-to-door -door, uh, basket delivery service where you could, you know, we'd take orders from the community, build out baskets and go out and deliver those. So I did a bit of soil growing uh, here in that phase, but after that first year or two, it's been pretty like, uh, aquaponics after that. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh... I've been going in reverse. So I started in the uh, in the garage with the eight by eight by eight module and the fish tanks, and I'm working my way out to organic soil farming. So I'm kind of doing it 
uh, do, doing it backwards, but uh, but I, I feel I feel like it gives me a, a good base. Uh, we're we're actually working on a uh, a, a nice little um, you know small scale outdoor grow uh, this year, and we're going to be running that uh, full organics. You know, uh, hopefully we'll be be able to uh, get some fish uh, amendment uh, out to them towards the end of the season as a top up because uh, we're just getting our uh, uh, we're getting our fish uh, seeded in this uh, in the system here uh, right now. So what we're doing this year is we're putting, you know, popped a bunch of seeds and we're uh, doing a, a hunt basically to see what will work really well uh, here in southern New Brunswick, uh, you know, in, in kind of this this very humid uh, North Atlantic uh, region here. So So, you know, hopefully we find some real Real winners, uh, but uh, yeah, that'll be a, that'll be our big exposure. It's uh, it's uh, coming up here right away. Soil uh, cannabis cultivation is uh, how I first got started with cannabis. So I was uh, doing that for a few years, and then it was my mother who actually ended up uh, having some koi, and we were taking the water from that and uh, feeding it to the plants, which we found some really good success doing that. And from there, we ended up uh, transitioning, got a tilapia system going, which uh, we played around with for a few years, which uh, we did have the dual root zones and salt pots, and then eventually ended up developing the new system that we're using at Habitat. Very cool. Very cool. So um, those you got, you know, so it seems like everyone kind of has some experience with both. What have been the big differences that you guys have noticed with the aquaponics versus your experiences growing, uh, you know, other crops in aquaponics or, you know, in soil? I mean, I would say like veg growth speed is probably the one that I would, I would point to. Like it's a, it's a glaring difference for me um, that I, I feel like you can see sort of across strains and different growing methods in comparison. I think hands down, I could say, even though it's a, you know, probably mostly anecdotal experience, it's, you know, probably, uh, you know, like going on six years worth now. And, uh, and every year I grow in different methods and I still feel like aquaponics grows, grows the fastest. And uh, in terms of veg growth, always seems to outperform everything else. I would uh, completely support that. We see very, very, very explosive growth during the veg stage. And one thing that we've also really been finding is the amount of trichome production as we dial the system in more and more is also better than anything that we were uh, producing before we got into aquaponics. I would agree with that as well, yeah. Absolutely. I've also noticed a big difference in terpenes. Uh, when we've done all of our controls, we haven't had a single, at least I personally have not had a single control where we've done soil versus aquaponics and not had a higher total terpene level. Um, it seems to be, you know, a huge, huge difference and particularly certain, you know, certain terpenes in particular, um, without getting into, a, you know, some, some deeper data uh, that uh, definitely seem to be expressed more. And we've also noticed a, an increase in expression of, of CBD uh, as well as THCV. Um, there's some, some methodologies that I've developed uh, working with a, couple, with, a, with a group in Colorado uh, on, on increasing THCV expression using uh, aquaponics to amplify particular stressors on the plant, uh, as stress responses on the plant that are kind of hard to do without that type of, of, of organic environment. And notice, in, you know, incredible increases in, in you know, pretty rare terpenes as, or in, and cannabinoids as well. So, um, and I know that uh, there was a group at, um, uh, from Green Relief Incorporated at the last Aquaponics Association conference that were dropping, had a whole presentation on um, uh, DWC only, media bed only, and dual root zone and, and showing the terpene comparisons and the cannabinoid comparisons. And uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. So, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting data and there's a white paper coming out on that about aquaponics, um, you know, through the, I, I don't remember the name of the university that's working with Green Relief up there, but um, uh, it's been a while since I've worked with them, but there is a university that's actually putting out a white paper on, you know, on exactly why it increases terpenes. So uh, something to be look out for later this year. 
Yeah, um, so yeah, a big difference I've noticed, I, I mean, as the others have stated, would definitely be growth speed. Uh, I think that's most easy, easily visualized, especially in the DWC by root growth, especially. I mean, we just see roots blow up and bit. I mean, we put a new uh, batch of transplants in some deep uh, water culture dual root zone pots. And I mean, within 48 hours, they're poking through the bottom of those pots and just running for the aquaponic water. So, I mean, those, I haven't seen growth rates like that in any, any other method that I've used before. Yeah, I feel like you can tell in like when the dual, when the plant starts taking up water from the bed, like you can, you can come in the next day and be like, oh, you know, don't have to water that plant anymore. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, there it goes, <laughs> found it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for instance, right now, currently in our greenhouse here, I'm currently working with Organic Innovations. They're in, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, if anyone's interested, you can find out more information on, on them, uh, you know, on Instagram, they're Organic Innovations. Okay, if you want to find out more. Um, but their main business model with aquaponics is clones. And, and then we also do flower, but clones really pay the bills around here. Uh, we, we, we can generate 30,000 clones a, a week out of our, our thousand square foot greenhouse. And we only have maybe five and a half thousand square foot of actual bed space. Uh, you know, and we can generate incredible numbers. Right now, depending on strain, we're averaging between 1.8 and 2.3 inches of growth per day on our, our in veg on our, on our plants in there. And we don't have everything completely dialed in yet. Uh, uh, I think we can even do do better than that. Uh, we don't have all of our KNF inputs uh, that I want to to get rolling. So, uh, and then I've also found that you so on average you get about twice the growth rate. So you can veg plants in a much faster time, and then you also get a, an increase on 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 speed in flower. I've noticed that some strains can you know be anywhere from five days to even you know two and a half weeks faster on the longer flowering strains. I don't know. Have you guys noticed a, an increase in and in short or a shortening in, in flowering times? Um, I grew, uh, I think it was Starfighter OG, in my last, uh, my last outdoor run before I got shut down in, in uh, Central Point, and uh, <clears throat> it was uh, so the aquaponic system Starfighter OG. All I think there was three plants in the outdoor aquaponic system and four plants in the uh, living soil beds, and all all three of them finished sooner than the other one, but that's the only one that I've done like at the same time in the same environment, uh, you know, so uh, only one one current grow that I can confirm uh, that happened at the same time um, and flowered sooner, but you know, I've done that with other plants as well. Um, elderberry bushes, grapes, strawberries, a number of different things that, you know, traditionally you wouldn't expect to see fruit out of them in the like let's say the first year you plant them and uh and on all of those we, we did across the board so um and from cutting too so it was a. Uh, I feel like it's something that I've seen in, in in other plants as well and and partly because when I first started out people were like oh you can't grow those types of plants in aquaponics and so you know a certain part of my personality is you know is like well <laughs> Are you sure? Are you challenging me? And so I think I grew broccoli and cauliflower and watermelon. Steve shaking his head like, oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and uh, so we grew all kinds of uh, cucumbers, uh, uh, things that you traditionally, you know, are, are told not to grow, including cannabis. And, you know, one point in time, there was a lot of people that would advise you against growing cannabis uh, in aquaponics. Um, and it's kind of the reason why Steve and I started the podcast and, uh, you know, was just to at least have a voice that says, well, you know, you kind of can and it'd be pretty good, actually. Yeah, and uh, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No worries. To date, uh, we've found taking uh, our strains the full 60 days, that's where you really get that extra expression of the trichomes, cannabinoids, terpenes, as mentioned. But where we are really saving time is uh, we're coming right down from our genetics room and we're uh, kicking over the next day. So we're not uh, needing to wait to give them that extra day from being stressed given that they're coming from an aquaponic system in the genetics room. 
down to an aquaponics. So compared to other scenarios you, where you'd be waiting one or two weeks to let the plants recover and be ready to go before kicking them over to the flower. I, I think that's really interesting because anymore I won't take a plant from outside and, and even repot it and put it into a dual root zone anymore and try to like expect to get top quality out of it, no matter where it comes from um, or how I repot it or what I mix it in. I always find that a, a clone or a seed that started in an aquaponic system finishes better in an aquaponic system. I'm, I've not figured out, um, you know, I've, I've transplanted, you know, probably, I don't know, I would say 15 different strains, um, you know, from other sources into aquaponics and then flowered them directly. And then, you know, it's always been the same result, which is that the, the next set of clones after that, uh, after the mom was in an aquaponic system and then clone uh, seemed to perform much better. You're missing those microbes. And, and in fact, you know who the original person uh, who, who first, as far as I'm aware, is the very first person to write about aquaponic cannabis anywhere is actually Breeder Steve, who they just had on the Future Cannabis Project. He, as far as I can tell, having done a lot of homework, he was the first person to put anything in writing around aquaponic cannabis way back in 1997 or 98 on overgrow.net, way back in the day. And um, uh, I remember reading some of his really early stuff and then didn't see anything on it, couldn't find it. And then I found someone had reposted like an archive of overgrow.net or whatever, and actually found that some of those really old posts. And, uh, um, and it's, it's just interesting to, you know, some of the other people that uh, are out there uh, also, you know, that are well-respected also enjoy aquaponics, but, you know, don't really get the, the chance to talk about it. But uh, he's someone that I definitely uh, uh, like to touch base with uh, occasionally because he is, you know, the, the first person to work with it, the first person to write about it uh, in terms of uh, anything on the internet that I'm aware of. He had a great episode on the podcast and enjoyed it. So. Oh, oh yeah. Out. Learned a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what about uh, what about economics? Um, you know, with aquaponics, we have a whole bunch of additional revenue streams. So why don't you tell us about some of the diff different additional revenue streams that you guys have with the aquaponics that maybe you wouldn't have had if you were a soil grower? So for ourselves, uh, we're doing coho salmon, which uh, right now at our micro facility is small scale, but we're able to uh, sell that to the local markets. So that's uh, very exciting. The way the licensing worked for us was uh, we had, had to uh, get an R&D aquaponics license to start to be able to get the coho salmon. And uh, it was about a year until we got our official license from uh, fisheries in Canada. So now in the summer, end of summertime here, we'll be able to officially start uh, selling our coho salmon. So very exciting. That is a revenue source that we would not have otherwise. And it's very delicious smoked. I like it uh, sashimi <laughs> grade as well. A little sushi for lunch. Absolutely. Have you, made, have you made infused salmon yet, though? Unfortunately, our license uh, will not currently allow us to do that, but that is uh, something that we're looking forward to doing in the future when uh, we're able to get the right licensing to be able to play around with that. But in your backyard, though. In your backyard, though, I want to. I want to. No, I want to touch on that one topic real quick <laughs> before we, we keep going. Is is that a lot of people aren't aware? So meat processing is federally regulated, and the inspectors are federal employees. They cannot legally set foot in a a United States cannabis facility as a federal employee working for the USDA for the meat processing because we're technically Schedule One still if we're doing THC. Okay, so you cannot actually get a, a license to kill your own fish in any uh, currently legally in any state. So you have to work with either a university or a third party meat processing company. You can actually do a complete vertical. Uh, and it's one of the areas that is kind of a, a weird quirk of the legality uh, and something that uh, people just don't think about. Um, I know I've written two separate grant proposals for two different universities for them to make mobile trucks that could actually provide for one in Oklahoma and one in another state. 
um, for, you know, to, to provide a service for those people because there's a, a need for that and, and they can't legally apply for a license. Yeah, we're, uh, we're all good here in Canada, Steve. Good oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, man. <laughs> yeah, no, we, uh, uh, when I, when I was running our, uh, food facility, uh, out of Edmonton there, uh, we, uh, we sold a few good batches, uh, more than a few rounds of our live, live organic, uh, black Nile tilapia to the Asian market in uh, Edmonton and Calgary. So, uh, you know, there'd be times, you know, our, our farm, our, our fish farm wasn't that big uh, for the facility, but you know, there'd be every, every few months, there'd be a, uh, uh, about a week where it was our fish uh, in all the, uh, most of the banks and around the, uh, uh, the city. And we were getting a great price per pound live. Uh, so uh, a very convenient thing to, you know, help offset you know, worry of, of processing is if you have a live fish market. And uh, so in our location uh, here on the, on the border of Maine, we're actually six hours from Boston, nine hours uh, from New York. So it gives us really good access uh, to even larger uh, Asian markets down there. And, uh, um, you know, when uh, <laughs> the economy is running normal, uh, it, it People will eat lots of fish from the live markets <laughs> down there. Yeah, so uh, so it's definitely been a major uh, uh, major component for us. And I, I've always taken the approach from day one with aquaponics. Like when you when you talk about the economics, it's really never a question for me on whether or not you should be building uh, a profitable fish component within your business. You know, if you can. You can go in, you know, like ha Habitat is, uh, is got that same mindset on the salmon side. Uh, you go in and you get that into a net profit position. And even though the revenues from that may pale in comparison to, you know, the price per gram in some great flour, you still want a net positive on your nutrient factory. And then it's not a drag in your in your business so i think i think you know that's uh you know an important thing uh, for for a lot of aquaponics people to really dive into and, and that's going to what's going to drive that is your market right and it's not really it's not really the fish it's not necessarily the fish you want to grow <laughs> you know it's, it, it could be uh uh you know it could be uh, the right fish the right fish for the right market and if you choose the wrong fish in the wrong proximity and you've got processing issues or transportation issues or licensing issues. Uh, like in our case uh, here, we had a tilapia as a foreign fish. So we had to do a environmental impact assessment so that they would make sure it wasn't an invasive species. Luckily, black Nile tilapia are from Egypt and Lake Nassar. So when a 28 degree fish jumps into a 10 degree east coast river it's instantly dead so uh <laughs> there is no there's no harm i was, uh, I was just gonna ask I was, I was just gonna ask was your environmental impact study just a tilapia and a cube of ice that you took out of the freezer like, yeah. here's, here's a tilapia yeah. in january in canada yeah <laughs> no we just we just put it in a tank and slowly turned down the temperature that is a complete joke <laughs> Cases that he, uh, in a but it does work. <laughs> yeah, that's really that's nice. Good. I ran up against that doing uh, running tilapia at a commercial lettuce grow uh, I was a part of down in Texas, where we had to go through the whole environmental impact and uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and the fisheries guys came out and we were checking, you know, checking make you had make sure you had three points of you know three lock points of entry between the fish. You know, this wasn't even cannabis where they were checking in on you know medication or a product or anything like that this was people checking to make sure our fish were under lock and key and, and secured oh yeah and and uh I, I mean when you when you get into certain aspects uh of animal animal husbandry and food safety uh it gets it gets pretty crazy pretty quick like when, when we're shipping uh across the border we need a we need a vet uh we need a veterinary checkup like every you know quarter or whatever it is 
Um, so, you know, and that's, that's to keep us certified to be shipping uh, stock uh, across, uh, across the pond. But then when you get into, uh, when you have a sizable enough fish farm, uh, and this is, this is something that we're like super excited about because, you know, when we go up to 200 metric, metric tons uh, a year, right? And, and even, even on a smaller scale, no matter how big your fish farm is, well, it's got to be at least a certain minimum size, but you'll get lots of extra solid waste out of that fish farm that you're not uh, that you're not using and you're not you're not passing on uh, to all your plants. So we're just excited about taking uh, that you know 50 tons a year of excess solids off of our off of our farm. Uh, we're we're designing an offtake uh, off of the uh, off the CO2 uh, of our of our fish system, I believe Habitat does does some of this uh, as well uh, to help feed feed into our rooms. So if you're really balancing your whole system properly, uh, you can pull that CO2 off that fish manure, and then you can take that fish manure, you can make another compost tea uh, out of it and feed it back uh, into your system, or just dump it outside in your outdoor grow, which would be just as good. That's really cool. That's the first I've heard of anyone using a, a you know mineralization for for CO two generation. That's that's very cool. Is anyone else here doing something similar to that? Um, I I worked on a project in Colorado where we had uh, we used uh, troughs where we had the fish tanks and we had them in, in kind of long runs, kind of like you would for trout. Mm -hmm. And above that, we had uh, uh, oyster mushrooms that were in uh, uh, kind of little like cabinets that mm -hmm. were hanging above the fish tanks in compartments. And we had CO2 sensors that would vent the CO2 out into the grow as the C it would build up. So the humidity from the fish tanks would provide the humidity we needed for the mushrooms and the mushrooms would provide the CO2 for the plant. So it's really cool to hear you, you're doing a whole different way of CO2 generation using the aquaponics and optimizing it. Uh, uh, that, that's a, a really cool thing. Is anyone else doing anything else uh, uh, similar or any other revenue streams that, uh, that you guys are doing? So yeah, um, I, sorry, go ahead. So Tanner, you are, we're correct. Uh, so in our mineralization room, we have a pipe from our digester and as well from the air that's uh, coming out where we're aerating the water to send that over to our flower room. So we've seen some uh, really good success with uh, capturing that CO2 and uh, designing our system, figuring out how you can uh, get everything that you need from the fish system. And uh, we're really getting that dialed down. Very cool. And it, it just goes to show you, you can do all different types of cool things with aquaponics that maybe you can't do with a traditional greenhouse. Um, do you guys want to talk about as well the advantages with climate control and how the water acts as thermal mass, especially we have two people up in Canada. Uh, I know I've done a commercial or a small commercial aquaponic uh, uh, cannabis grow. We did a 50 by 30 by 18 foot greenhouse when I was with the aquaponics source with one of the licenses with me and another employee there. And um, uh, we managed to do a whole fit, uh, that whole run through a whole winter with just 87 pounds of propane, uh, just enough to heat the water. So uh, do you guys want to talk about that and how the thermal mass from the aquaponics can give you huge advantages, especially in cooler climates? For ourselves, uh, we have not tapped into that yet. Uh, to date, we're using a chiller, but it is something in a new design that we are taking a very close look at as you mentioned, how to take advantage of that. So that's uh, something we're digging into at the moment. Yeah, like, uh, you know, on, on our end, uh, this gives you this massive opportunity for really, really intelligent water water management uh, within your whole facility. I mean, that that's one of the, and, and, you know, it doesn't matter on small scale or large scale, but, uh, but you just have more water to capture or deal with. Um, one one thing that we're looking at, and this is as we phase our phase our farm uh, out uh, over the next couple of years, because you know our, our first phase was ten thousand square feet of a hundred thousand square foot building. So we're we're the nice thing is because we phase it out, we'll kind of get to improve this as we go forward. Um, but you know, how, how do you pull the uh, extra water off your condenser and uh, you know, either push that into gray water or it's condensed water. Uh, so it's a completely neutral uh, pH as well, right? So 
can you purify that? Do we put it back into our fish tanks? Do we just turn it into gray water? Uh, could that be used as a, um, uh, you know, as a uh, item to control your pH if you don't have great water, perfect water uh, coming into your system? Uh, so for us, it's all about, you know, how can we move that water around? Uh, the 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 neat thing neat thing about uh, uh, where we have our tilapia output calculated to feed our to feed our vertical racking system is that uh, um, it'll actually require 10% fresh water changes for the fish per day, for, you know, up to even 15% versus where tilapia doesn't need a ton of fresh water. So, so they would actually be happy at about 5% fresh water changes a day. Um, so I kind of took it off into a tangent, Steve, just like water, uh, <laughs> water, water design and, and, and where, where we, where we're putting, putting it and what we're doing with it. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the funnest things I, I, I like about the whole aquaponics in general is we've got places to put things so we can get rid of the waste. Right. I've had a, a great luck uh, hybridizing the um, both with geothermal and then with solar water heating on, on heat exchangers um, uh, for for heating that. But yes, absolutely. And uh, there's all again. It just goes to show you there's all different ways that you can use that water in order to benefit your plants in ways that you know are still doing it in an organic kind of living soil. And one way I wish people would think of it more is think don't think of it so much as uh, you know organic hydroponics. Think of it as aquatic soil. Um, you know, it, it really represents that, especially when you look at the biodiversity of it. You know, uh, NASA did a study uh, a couple of years ago where they were trying to figure out which microbes, if we go to Mars, do we need to bring to do mineralization for plants in an aquatic environment? If we're going to bring fish or we're going to bring some kind of aquatic creature that we're going to farm for food, what and, and we need and we're going to grow it for nitrogen production to feed plants, what what microbe? package do we need to bring to have you know full mineralization for all your different plant essential minerals and what they did is they went and they did a, a, a dna study where they took samples from a whole bunch of aquaculture facilities aquaponic facilities uh, a couple nearby properties and, and then uh soil and they actually found that uh you know uh, <laughs> the most uh, diverse soil wasn't uh, even within 168 or was a uh, the, I'm sorry, the aquaponics was 168% more biodiverse in terms of number of different species than even the most biodiverse soil was. So, uh, you know, when you're strictly talking about, uh, you know, biodiversity and, and stimulating that plant's immune system in ways that, um, uh, you know, that uh, are not necessarily um, uh, 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 pathogenic it really helps again increase that terpene expression because remember the plant is just making you know defense mechanisms and, and things going hey this is in the environment I should probably prepare for that or this and the other and um, it's also where you see people fail too when you see people you know switch over to corn fields and other things and they don't prepare for that kind of stuff and then you do see them with with these outbreaks that you see with a lot of these hemp fields and stuff that people that have mm -hmm. done that so uh, we kind of show you the two ends of the the, the, the thing the extremes of that but um, well, the, we thing, the thing I, uh, uh, the, 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 the thing that, and, and you just kind of touched on it, I just want to throw in here that excites me about all of our abilities with aquaponics is to really play with the, the, uh, the microbial expression, uh, through, through the fish manure, uh, via the input into our fish, um, so basically designer fish diets to influence the microbiome of the fish and how, how are those microbes expressed into your living water and then the path to, uh, well, am I creating new stresses, <clears throat> new microbes, new bacteria culture, right? Have I, have I uh, changed the diet enough to create that stress that you're after in that, in that turf or that uh, cannabinoid and that's uh you know it's going to take a while to uh, to figure out but we can play with that through the through the uh through the diet right and, and 78 percent of the microbes in the soil are you know can also live in aquaponics and vice versa in, in aquatics so i really do think with, with more research with these aquatic microbes you're going to see a lot of them being transitioned over into the soil realm and people using them to you know you're going to see more things like mammoth pea or more things where uh, these these isolated microbial chains are are going to be 
um, you know, uh, uh, more and more common and, and kind of a, there really is an area for, for growth, both in research as well as, you know, e economic is probably a few billion dollars in, in research and the, you know, mineralization with, with natural occurring uh, uh, microbes. So uh, in the aquatic environment, because everyone focuses so much on the terrestrial uh, and not really so much in that direction in terms of specifically plant boosting stuff. So, you know, there is a, a huge realm, of, you know, if you're, you're just getting started in college or something like that, or you want to get into the industry and you want to research microbes, and you want to find something that could be profitable, that there's a whole industry that just basically is, has, has maybe 1% of the research has been done today on it. Um, and it just is, hasn't been done to date at all. There's no industries out there that are focusing on it. And, um, you know, it really is an area that just needs a lot of research. Yeah, you, really, you really hit that on the head, Steve. That's uh, exactly our methodology with uh, the system we put together is how can we get the water that our salmon's producing to be everything that plants need to thrive on. So very well said. So if you guys then like, because I understand, you know, altering the food in order to, um, you know, to ch and change the diet of the fish to change the nutrient profile. Um, so would you switch your food in the flowering phase to be something different than the veg phase, or how? How would no, that? No, I, I would, I would do, uh, I would do full life cycle uh, strain comparisons, right? Because I think, uh, I think. I think in an aquaponics uh, or, or a live live feed setting, and if you're trying to compare a single strain and its performance from uh, the baseline to your to your comparison when you change the fish feed, uh, at, at least initially, I think it's got to be you know through the through the whole life cycle uh, of of that plant on one feed. So do do. Uh, do your steady eddy strains for, for many good runs where you know consistency uh, in them and understand the uh, understand the microbial culture uh, that's driving that right then bring in bring in your new fish feed measure what's happening there and then run those same strains uh, through with those with those new with those new cultures and then start uh, seeing the differences and tracing them. So, so uh, I had the pleasure of doing some research with the uh, back when I worked at the aquaponics source and uh, we actually did a whole bunch of different fish species and we looked at the nutrient breakdown of their waste uh, that we sent off for and and it really comes down to um, <laughs> it really comes down to uh, uh, you know, protein. So the higher the protein percentage, the more you're going to get converted into nitrogen. Uh, so if you're looking at, if you were designing a very large scale facility, you would want to do uh, predators and carnivores or more carnivore heavy stuff for your veg rooms. And you'd want to do omnivores and more, uh, uh, you know, um, herbivores or herbivorous fish for your flowering rooms because they're going to tend to put out more potassium yeah, more, so, more yeah. phosphorus and, and those types of things so um and, and when why do my systems when i design them and, and bane knows this because he's he's actually worked under one that i've designed we actually design it so that you can shift the fish tanks so over you open or close a valve and suddenly we can change how many fish tanks are going over to that one greenhouse and whatnot so we can have you know dial in exactly how much nutrients are going into that system uh, based on how many fish tanks are going in there so uh, you can really do a lot with that and i'm sure you guys do do something similar as well well i'm sure that because i know not everyone is closed loop right i think there's quite a few you know drained to waste or whatever uh, oh get delivery yay nobody brings me a cat <laughs> i'm jealous oh nice <clears throat> anyway so uh so yeah i think that uh it just kind of depends on on what your system is, I think that when you have a closed loop system, you have a, you know a couple more concerns than if you're doing a you know a, a drain of waste or drain the feed or whatever decoupled whatever whatever label you want to put on it. Um, you know that they all end up a little bit different. Is anybody else doing a closed loop besides me and Steve? I think Bain is right. You're quiet there, Bain. Are you still muted? Yeah. Oh, there. Hey, I think we're. Uh, yeah, so we're closed loop. All of our uh, deep water culture and the veg is uh, 
is one closed loop. We do pull off of that for feeding some of the uh, flower stuff. So there, it's open in a way and we're chopping off and exchanging water, but for the majority of the time it's running closed. That makes sense. Um, there was a question in chat asking about, you know, soil and, and aquaponics. Um, so uh, myself and I believe Bain and Marty also both use dual root zone aquaponics. I'm not sure about uh, Tanner and Leanne, but um, uh, I know that we do something called dual root zone aquaponics. So basically, um, uh, we'll use uh, this beer bottle here, for example. All right. So imagine the bottom half where the beer is, is where your hydrogen uh, would be. So or, or lava rock or, or gravel. And then the upper half here would be soil. So we, we do living soil on top of that. In fact, I just posted some pictures on my Instagram. We had a mushroom uh, outburst in, a, in our greenhouse. Uh, we use mushroom compost and we had mushrooms bursting out of our, our pots all over the place in the greenhouse. It was really cool. Um, but anyways, uh, so that living soil actually provides all your terrestrial microbes, a place for your mycorrhizal fungi and, and your other plant beneficial terrestrial microbes to live. And then allows those roots to grow through the bottom uh, into that, that flood and drain layer. And we separate them with a burlap or other root permeable, permeable cloth uh, and allows, again, those roots to bust through while uh, holding that soil up. And we found that that really gives you the most level of control, at least in my opinion, um, a, a, a little bit of an edge as far as a nutrient control and, and dialing things in. And then again, you get the best of both worlds. We find that, uh, to, you know, typically there's have fewer incidences of, of mold and, and mildews, uh, as well as fewer incidences of, um, of pest problems and, and also for anchoring. So uh, when you're putting them directly in the beds, if you don't scrog them right away, uh, uh, with the net cups and things like that, they can be uh, quite floppy. So um, by putting them in the pots, it gives them enough weight, especially if you're going to do an outdoor project on a home grow, uh, the weight of the bottom, you know, especially with the wind and things like that uh, really helps keep them stabilized. I don't know if uh, Marty or Bain want to talk about their experiences with it. Yeah, I totally agree on the, uh, on the dual root zone has helping with weight a lot. I uh, know I've struggled a couple of times with exactly like you said, uh, if you don't get the net on them right away. Once they sit on top of those boards for long enough, as y'all know, they grow so fast that they'll just take off, get real top heavy. And then if you've got them in the converted lettuce boards, like most people are running them in, uh, they don't really have a lot of purchase. Yeah, I think that, you know, probably like support wise, you know, because I've, I've grown both ways, both in dual root zone and not in dual root zone. And uh, you can check them all out on my uh, YouTube channel at AP Meds, uh, going back, I think five years now or something like that. And, uh, but yeah, I definitely had an issue of, you know, when attempting to uh, train plants to a strong net, for instance, rather than the, the plant bending like this the entire plant, it would pull itself sideways like this. And so the, it wouldn't do the same thing to the plant structure so that, and get exactly what you wanted. It was just a plant that was leaning over sideways and not, not getting the, the change that, that you want in order to get a full straw net. So it definitely helped in that sense too, because the, the hydrogen was just too loose. And then also growing outdoors, um, you know, the, the wind, even a, a small amount of wind could blow a plant over that was just sitting in hydrogen, especially once they get to, you know, five feet tall or so, um, you know, they can, they can catch a pretty good sale. <laughs> and, uh, um, so the, the dual root zone pot really uh, helps have a solid base to it and keeps it from, uh, from completely tipping over in, inside the media. Uh, and I know there's there's lots of other successful ways to do it as well. Uh, do you guys want to talk about uh, Tanner and Leanne, uh, how you guys do? Because you guys are a little bit different, but your stuff works. I know, uh, uh, Leanne, uh, I'm definitely uh, sal definitely salivate over your pictures regularly. Oh, you're muted there, bud. Unmuted now. Hello. You're good. We're good. Awesome. 
So yeah, we're uh, using neon green discs. So that's uh, how we actually, when we take our cuttings, we end up uh, propagating with those in our uh, cloners. And then from we take them downstairs and right now we have a uh, rafts that we are uh, have holes drilled into them and we put those directly into the system. And you are correct, we uh, do get trellis up right away. And uh, we end up having a couple layers to make sure that uh, those plants get the right support for them. So I could see uh, being in a soil scenario, definitely gonna have more developed support, but the roots, they do explode in that water and uh, you're gonna find a lot of support that way as well. But you got oh, those yeah. big heavy uh, buds. What one thing I would also suggest is even if you're, you're going to do D DWC, don't do a plant with a really long veg because what will happen is even if you support it with the net and I've, we've tried this, we did like a, you know, tried to do a summer run in DWC in, in, a, in a greenhouse, the weight, the physical weight of the whole thing will actually push itself down, you know, the stalk further and further down into the water <laughs> and push the net cup down in uh, depending on how quickly it is. But uh uh, and what size you're using. But um, again, if you're doing a normal run, like a, on a commercial production, you never run into that problem. Uh, you're only going to run into that if you did a, uh, a you know, a, a full summer run or something like that. But uh, yeah, we've found uh, going in with plants that we either vegged a little long or uh, came down as large veg plants that uh, they did not end up flowering as well as ones that are around that eight inches coming down, given that you have such explosive growth there. It's uh, really the right size and doing that, we're doing vertical as well. We're working within a four foot uh, space. So we're not growing really tall, large plants. We're going up, growing them in a tight space. Uh, you have anything else you wanted to mention there, uh, uh, Tanner? Uh, yeah, no, we're, uh, we're, he we're heading into this in a uh, living soil. Uh, status right now so we're uh, everything we've got potted up right now is uh is all of our mother stock right so so what we've been doing is uh, uh basically pheno hunting here for the last uh four five six months now and uh you know we've got uh we've got our royal cushions uh built up um you know we got uh, uh got some uh, la peer cush hollywood og uh, so all of that is coming in in living soil right now, and we're going to move all, we're going to build all our stock like that. And then as we turn our system on, we're going to be feeding, uh, the aquaculture nutrient, uh, top feed to the soil here just in the early days. And, uh, you know, but we've got our uh, one grow room set up with four solenoids, one, one per table. Uh, so we're, we're good for complete top irrig irrigation and we can drop to uh, bottom feed uh, dual root zone, uh, you know, quite easily as we uh, explore different mediums. But, uh, but we're, you know, just happy to be starting in the full living soil experience because that's really what we're, what we're aiming for on the, uh, you know, on the outdoor as well. So it's, uh, it's a good place to start uh, with our strains and, uh, you know, as we uh, we sort through them, we're going to kind of know uh, where they need to go. But we're we're looking for uh, stout plants, right? Which why the, is why the Royal is a uh, is a pretty good pretty good plant. It's fat and droopy, and uh, you know it's coming in coming in thick. So so uh, you know we're looking you know looking for those plants that we can go vertical with. Awesome, yeah. Um... Uh, and, and again, there's, there's lots of different ways to, to do it. And uh, everyone has different ways that, that work for them. Um, uh, I, you know, I, it's just what we, you know, we all find the, the methodology that works for us. And again, with aquaponics, you know, there, there is a lot of different ways that, that people design their systems and look at things. So on that note, let's talk about a little bit about minerals and, and, um, and uh, microbes. So we had a question from Chad. If I use salt water aquaponics to feed seawater first to break down salts, will there be enough ammonia to grow cannabis plants? Um, I guess the, the easy question for that would be the fact that you have a high level of sodium. And uh, unless you did a huge flat with a ton of mangrove trees, uh, you're not going to be able to absorb enough sodium to, to actually do much of anything. So, uh, I, I, you know, you could absolutely aquaculturally raise your own uh, 
a seaweed off of a reef tank or something like that but I, I, you know it wouldn't really be profitable in any kind of way or or uh, you know honestly worth all the labor um let me look here so we have uh so let's talk a little bit about uh any other um pros or uh what are the downsides that you guys have found with aquaponics or maybe some of the learning curves that maybe were more difficult than you you were expecting for ourselves i don't know if it was unexpected but um so i grew up raising cattle in an agriculture background so I'd had a very much a uh, farming background. When we uh, started up, we really had to be on top of the system. Sometimes you get alarms at two in the morning, you had to be ready to respond to them, um, say a pump wasn't working right or something got clogged on you. So that was one thing fortunate that we put in our system is we did have all those alarms and uh, we had a good crew that was able to make sure that we got up and uh, were there to tackle the problem and people close to the facility. Because there was quite a few scenarios that we went in if we had left it for 36 hours, the scene would have not been so good. And as well, when you have that initial startup uh, in our aquaponic system, when you're going through your nitrate ammonia spikes, you really gotta be paying attention to your water quality. We were, uh, able to get through without having any big uh, losses of our fish but i know if uh, you weren't on top of it and paying attention to your water quality that is uh, something that could happen very quickly yeah i definitely agree with that and i could mirror that uh what you said was starting up the system having somebody there who's able to check on pumps and check through the night and, and make sure it doesn't run for 12 hours with the valve shut that should have been opened at the end of the day is, is huge and being able to stay on top of your water quality just like you were saying during system startup uh, has has been a big learning curve and something that's got to be taken really seriously yeah even a human error I've heard of uh, some large systems that somebody will go through doing some cleaning, et cetera, and leave a valve open, walk away, and all of a sudden all your water is gone. So it's really stuff you got to be on top of. Make sure you got uh, good SOPs and checklists before you leave the facility to make sure everything's uh, running correctly before you're shutting the doors and everybody's not in there for a little bit. Nah, somebody forgot to turn the backup <laughs> generator on. And, and floor drains. Floor drains are very important. Floor drains. Yeah, floor drains. <laughs> For when the flood does happen. Have lots of flood. They will happen. Floor drains. It will happen. It will happen. <laughs> the important thing is to make sure it doesn't build up enough to get into the electronics. <laughs> That's the important part. I'm getting all my floods out of the way before the fish. You know, I've, I've flooded it, you know, get, get, getting, it, getting it started up. <laughs> Always set a phone timer when you turn on a pump. <laughs> That's always big. Don't stare at the can't. Don't stare at the plants too long, and think you've got time to get back. <laughs> well, there's always something. If you try to walk around the farm and do a full 360 or something, you know something's gonna grab you. So me having the having the alarm set on the phone, I've got a. A variable you know how long does it take to fill the IBC okay that's my 15 minute timer the big fish tank is 30 and so on yeah. and so forth for come back around and check on that phone yeah. and the camera the fish cam fish cam is very important you look at the fish cam you see the fish they're fine <laughs> yeah when we yeah, uh, when, when we started we started uh, because we were running a completely closed loop system which I'm glad I did because uh, it really gave us that complete understanding of when you're doing that, when your water is just doing this like all day between the uh, uh, between the fish and the uh, and the plants, which is a good way to cycle the water uh, through your system. So you're always moving water, um, uh, you know. You're but you're making sacrifices and you're just trying to do this continual continual dance between your fish farm and your your plant production side uh, so you know coming out of that you know that's why why we're landed in a more of a decoupled you know a decoupled system where you're uh, you know you've got your fish farm and your nutrients are coming over into your system and you've got a little more 
fine tune control and you can keep your temperatures perfect between your two systems. Uh, but yeah, th that was, uh, those are some, <laughs> those are some pretty tough days, uh, you know, when your pHs were, were going up and down between your fish and your, uh, and your uh, plants, right? <laughs> yeah, I learned yeah, that, and that to also uh, definitely make sure you set a timer there at the early stage of our facility, you'd be filling up a barrel you get distracted by going to do something else and all of a sudden your barrel starts being over full and flooding everywhere. And then as well, very good point on the backup generator. So we actually knew that there was a Canadian uh, winter storm coming. So we tested our generator the days before the storm was supposed to be there, fired up, everything worked well, but uh, we did not check all the fluids. So come the day when we uh, were correct and the backup power went down, the generator wasn't firing up. So luckily we had the needed fluid on hand, but uh, it took us about 30 minutes to get that thing fired up. So back up gens and make sure you're checking all your uh, fluids as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's something that's extremely critical for aquaponics systems because if that system goes down, everything dies. Most, most commercial size systems, you know, you have maybe an hour before you're going to start losing fish uh, without a backup generator. So, uh, you know, making sure you have a gen uh, you know, gas power. And, and if you're doing really big scale, you know, gas turbines can be really good because you can get that hot and cold off of them aside from the power as well. Uh, for those of you that are, are looking at that, you know, very large scale and, and want to have that on-site power generation. Um, so on the, on the topic of minerals, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, especially I, you know, I also on a, a separate note, run a, a uh, nutrient dosing uh, company where we do consulting for all that stuff. The nutrients that you need to get really good flour and aquaponics are way lower than hydro. You know, your potassium levels, your phosphorus, your nitrogen. And it really is, you know, from those microbes, the same way it does in living soil, where you don't need to have those super high levels of hydronutrients. You know, by having those lower levels from those natural inputs and those microbe inputs work like little syringes and doctors giving you, you know, uh, syringes uh, of nutrients getting directly into that. And, and, and does make a huge difference. Uh, uh, and, and especially, uh, you know, we don't have to flush them. So do you guys flush your plants as, as one example of, of the lower nutrients? Uh, Excuse me, sorry. Um, I don't flush personally. Um, I've never, I mean, I guess it, it kind of depends. Like I stopped feeding. So I think that there's so many different ways that people define like what flushing is. Um, that uh, um, it can get a little construed. I think because people people do different things and describe it the same way, and then a lot of discussion happens that's not really like effective. Um, but uh, but yeah, so some people describe it as just feeding nothing but water the entire way through, uh, like the last couple weeks of uh, flowering. So if you're if you're doing hydro or something where you're feeding a lot towards the end, then I suppose that, that makes sense. But obviously in aquaponics, there's not like much of a way to turn off nutrients and, and not have them in there anymore. So, um, but you also never have the high concentrations of, of nutrients that you would be trying to flush out anyway. Um, so you, or your fish would just die. I mean, I think that's probably like, the simplest version that I can I can break it down to in the way that I look at it is that um, yeah you you can if you're talking about flushing as not feeding very many nutrients towards the end then yes I try to cut my feed down towards the end I definitely don't feed any nutrient teas towards the end and I try to you know basically just let them finish without increasing the nutrient profile in my system so I guess yes, and that way you could consider it flushing, um, because otherwise people that do live in soil, you'd be like, well, I don't feed anything but water the entire way through anyway. Um, you know, like, so you, am I just flushing the entire time? And so I just think that a lot of wires get crossed when you use the term flushing. So I think that I tried to distill it down to reducing the nutrients that are available to the plant late in the flowering stages that makes sense. So on the habitat setup, we're doing a similar methodology. So 
our EC is bounces between a 0 0.9 to a one through our system. But given uh, that we do have the decoupled system, for the last 10 days there, we end up uh, not sending that uh, to the flower room. And uh, we're just topping up uh, what they're consuming with fresh water. But uh, we do have more trials to run to uh, be able to hone in on that more. Yeah, I'd say our method is very much in line with uh, kind of what you said, Marty. We don't so much flush as cut back on peas and different things like that so that our plants are just receiving aquaponic water and not any of the additional things that we would kind of give them uh, through flower. Yeah. Yeah, and from from, uh, from our perspective, you know, on a, on a living soil, uh, kind of nutrient uh, subsidize medium with aqua, aquaponics water, uh, you know, same thing. We're, we're, we're trying to just reach that uh, balance of where the plant's going to take all the nutrients it needs in that pot, um, plus what we topped it up with at the appropriate time, right, for the best, best punch. Awesome. So, uh, so what metrics are you guys uh, testing for regularly? Maybe there's a better, that's a, a, a real good question. So um, uh, me personally, uh, I te we test uh, any farm that I work with, we test every other week. So every two weeks, uh, and then once everything's, you know, totally stabilized and we know the strains that we have, then we can cut back to once a month. Um, but we find that really gives us a, the best ability to really fine tune our nutrients. So how often are you guys testing and, and what are you testing for? So uh, for us right now, we are uh, testing all the macro and micro so that we're able to understand our system. And uh, as we we're discussing earlier, the aquatic soil that we're developing and the ways that we're able to refine that. So we are testing very frequently all macro and micro, and then as well watching the results that we're getting in our system to see what little tweaks we possibly could make to uh, continue to improve and advance from there yeah and uh you know fr from our from our perspective it's it's everything um you know it's uh it's uh nutrient profile uh in in the soil at certain points the the ec going in uh from the from the water and you know uh, the the vpd and <laughs> you know the vpd and the exact uh, the exact amount of times it's been watered. Um, I mean, we're, we're just going to really do our best to uh, be capturing all the, all the variables. It's not, it's not very hard to do, right. You know, it doesn't take a very expensive um, uh, system to, to really data log everything that's, that's going on in your room on a per, on a per strain uh, uh, basis. So, so we're, we're leaning in towards a, uh, uh, you know, live monitoring, uh, right, right, right now, right now, while we install our system, we're just writing everything down 50 times a day and using multiple different pH monitors. I got like 11 of those $10 ones that you stick in the, <laughs> the two prong, you jam it in the soil, <laughs> then you use three of them to make sure that they work. Cause if all three of them are the same, they work. <laughs> yeah only then can you confirm for sure yeah you gotta you gotta triple down on those yeah <laughs> yeah so we're uh like you said water is kind of everything for for the aquaponic farm we'll do our full panel tests uh every two weeks so that's all of our macros our micros and then we'll add uh silica on to the, yeah there it is yeah uh, <laughs> so convenient and cheap <laughs> uh steve steve can you actually bring that back and show it uh, uh can you can you bring it back yeah you get that three-way meter promo in here how much are you getting paid for that steve all right <laughs> it's awesome it's got ph light uh and moisture. Well, like you said you need to buy them in threes <laughs> kind of yeah, oh, it's good too. It's it's nice to you know it's nice to check the moisture in your soil if you're not sure, right? If you're not sure that top three inches, 
is uh, moist, right? Yeah, if you can't <laughs> figure that one out, you better get the meter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll test our, our water for the full panel every two weeks, and then uh, we'll take the little API dropper test to it for ammonia and nitrate just to kind of keep a pulse on it every other day. And then, of course, we've got um, pH monitors that are constantly data logging and set up to alarm if anything kind of crazy goes on. We, we run the, um, oh, the Blue Lab Guardians that do us pretty good on, on that uh front you can have them you know set up on the phone where you're you can always check in on them whenever you get to worrying about the fish in the middle of the night and go oh my god okay all right they're 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 doing just fine they're comfortable <laughs> yeah i should mention on the raising salmon side as well we, they do require a very tight water parameters so making sure that we're on top of the ammonia nitrate their ph and their water temperature. Salmon, you gotta keep at a 14 to have healthy growth. So that's something that we're uh, constantly monitoring to make sure that uh, we're raising those awesome salmon. So what type of electronic monitoring are you guys using? Uh, we, you, we were all talking about uh, uh, that just before this. Uh, what, are you guys using any particular systems or, or what different types of ways are you guys monitoring your nutrients? Like uh, as far as real time. Yeah, for us, we just, uh, we're using digital water temp readers, pH readers that uh, fire to uh, some other panel that send out alerts to us. I don't know the name of the specific system because we ended up using a couple of different things to direct people. But yeah, it's uh, something that ends up if our pH happens to get out of whack that we get a l email on our phone. Yeah, so I, m I mentioned earlier, we're doing the um, the Blue Lab Guardians are the ones that we're currently running at the farm. A couple hundred bucks a piece, so they're, they're a little pricey if you're gonna get a, a whole bunch of them to screw throughout the farm, but I think it, it's worth having because they have a an app that's at least decent at getting you uh, connected to a phone or computer and bouncing that back so you can always kind of check in on the system. Yeah, yeah, right now, uh, right now we're looking at a few different options, but you know, honestly, one of the one of the easiest to use and and uh, simplest option is that you can you can uh, let you know first for getting started anyways is a troll you troll master system. They've got all the uh, the brain and the uh, uh, the Wi-Fi transmitters and the sensors uh, that you need, and you can overlay that. Uh, it's not only a sensing system; it's actually your control system. So we're we're actually combining our controls and our and our sensors basically into one, right? So like our heaters, our our you know our humidifi humidifiers uh, will all be uh, run off of the same system that'll be pulling uh, our our data log in, and then uh, uh, similar to, to Lane, you know, uh, using blue, blue lab, like, like sensors in the water and, and, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, uh in all the grow rooms. All right. Um, so, uh, what, what are some of the different questions that you guys get from when people find out that you do aquaponics? I know one that I commonly get is, does, does the cannabis taste like fish or does the fish, you know, does it taste fishy or does it taste like fish? fish or yeah. 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 What are some of the other, what are some of the other questions that you get all the time and, and maybe the answers to those questions? I get kind of the inverse of that one a lot is that if you eat the fish, will you get high? So I guess that's the yeah. other side of that coin. Yeah. I don't know. That seems even weirder to me, but I definitely got that. But both seem kind of ridiculous, I think. Like, because I think they're joking and then I laugh and yeah. they still want me to answer. And then I'm they're like, no, really though. Can yeah. I get some fish? <laughs> yeah, a lot, of pe a lot of people like ask me if, we're feeding the fish the feeding the fish weed right so it's from you know what they're thinking yeah or, or i guess maybe like one of the ones i get all the time is like do i have to do i have why do i have to put anything in besides fish food you know like why can't i just feed my fish um 
probably another one I get on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah people not understanding that, uh, that there's more to fish nutrients or plant nutrients than just what fish eat. You know, f fish biology was not designed to grow cannabis plants, right? So, um, <laughs> unfortunately, as much as we may miss that the case. Yeah. I do think that we limit like aquaponics to fish a lot, you know, but I think worms do <laughs> a significant amount of work, at least in my system. And I've, I've always kind of used the two. I have worm bins, like red wigglers and worms in my bins that provide a lot of the, the other nutrients besides nitrogen. Um, and so, you know, I kind of feel like they, uh, you know, the fish get all the attention and the worms do all the work in a lot of different ways. So um, not that they aren't great or work together, but, you know, there's a, at least in, in my system, you know, the worms pull a ton of weight for sure. Hey guys, this is uh, Tom. I have a question for you. Um, what is the uh, end destination for uh, for all of your uh, aquaponics uh, um, weed? Is it all going to wind up as flour, or are there other ideal uh, product topicals concentrates? And like, would you can, would you grow special strains if it, you knew it was going to be used to make hash, even if you're growing it, making it hydroponically? Yeah, so for uh, Habitat, right now, we're only able to produce flour and uh, that in Canada, we sell through the shelter market with our current license. But uh, we absolutely do look to get into developing strains for concentrates here in the near future that we're able to get into doing the oils, rosin, hash, and uh, what we want to do is really keep everything we're doing as close to the flower and the full profile as possible. Yeah, for for us, uh, you know, we're 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 really gonna gonna let the strain uh, dictate, you know, if it if it goes into flower uh, or if it you know would, is going to go into a good pre roll. Um, but we're looking for you know we're looking for you know, really greasy, terpy, terpy strains. Um, uh, and, and that's gonna, you know, make it into decide where it goes. Uh, alongside our flower launch, we're working on uh, infused uh, health and wellness uh, products. So we got, uh, you know, bath bombs is, uh, is a thing that uh, the Stewart Farms has been doing uh, for a while. And uh, so uh, we're looking at that, some massage oils, um, and that's just something that uh, that we can uh, get out to market uh, quick while we're we're sorting through our, uh, our our genetic library. So so you know our our primary focus in the flower rooms is really just uh, you know uh, hunting through uh, the the library of uh, great stock that we have and and deciding uh, where that goes. But uh, you know definitely definitely uh, you know also trekking towards a, a really nice canagar because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big canagar guy myself. And if we can uh, get some uh, nice, uh, nice uh, rosin infused uh, canagars out there on the Canadian market, um, you know, we're in the process of figuring that out uh, right now. So are you going to talk in my life with a bath bomb? What's that? Are you going to end your night with a bath bomb? <laughs> Well, pro probably You're gonna have some alone time with the bath bomb <laughs> and the canagar. Well, it, I mean, the commercial writes itself, and it's uh, <laughs> yeah, for me as a medical producer, maybe I don't know if anybody else is here or everyone else is recreational. This background you got there, see, like, um, you know, ours is a little bit more, more tailored to needs of patients, so you know, some of them want or need a full plant extract, like a, like an RSO made. So, you know, we facilitate that to get made or some of them need a tincture, uh, you know, where it needs to be extracted and then put into specific doses and then combined together. So, um, you know, it just kind of depends uh, a little bit more on the patient first and then everything above that, you know, is, uh, 
all the all the overhead you know, a lot of times gets uh, you know either distributed as additional flour or uh, you know a lot of times when the patients will already be making extra of something like one one patient will have extra gummy bears and they like to share or whatever and however it works out so in the medical world it's a little uh, different than uh, just marketing products directly to the end user but I would say probably most of it gets uh, consumed as flour or um, put into some sort of edible slash medication. So kind of, I guess a little bit of everything. Not a, not a lot of rosin, not a lot of pressing getting requested in the medical world. Not, I guess I'm not sure why that is or um, what, but that's I guess the only thing that I could really say about the uh, the medical market is that it's a, it's a little bit more specialized to whoever you're dealing with. So we, so here we at Organic Innovations in Oklahoma, we take, you know, 70, 80% of it, all the stuff that's easily trimmable pretty quickly, that all goes to flour for flour sale and the rest goes into concentrate. Occasionally, you know, we'll grow some stuff that's a little more airy, uh, specifically for concentrate. But I think that, again, you, you know, you kind of grow for concentrate or you go, for, you grow for bud. Uh, you know, if you're going to primarily lean your your market towards one or the other, uh, unless you really split your your uh, production, because you know the the cultivars that are going to produce you know ultra heavy uh, production for for resin uh, for concentrate, and, you know, might not necessarily be ones that you want to have super dense buds because that's going to have a higher chance of mold, especially with the fact that we do have a higher humidity than normal. We don't really like to have those super giant. You know, I don't want to have maybe something like a god bud that has like a like, like an arm sized bud. Um, because, uh, you know, that can cause us a little bit more issues. Not that we have that many problems using probiotics, but, um, you know, you, you want to reduce your chances of problems to begin with. So, uh, again, I think that goes back to, and I'm, I, mean, I know that plenty of other people have talked about that topic. Uh, I know I've heard Frenchie talk about that topic at least 30 times. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you kind of need to decide what you're going for one or the other. But in general, I find that most of the aquaponic people are growing for either that high-end concentrate or for the high-end, you know, more connoisseur or boutique flower, uh, because it does have a, a very different flavor and, and a more richer flavor uh, to the smoke uh, and also burns very cleanly. Uh, I know uh, uh, quite a few people have talked about that in the past and Breeder Steve was just talking about that on, on your, your channel uh, about a week ago. Yeah, yeah, I, I, to I mean, I totally agree, Steve. Like that's, that's what we're, you know, we've got two different kind of focuses and the reason we're doing our outdoor sift is to find that greasy strain that that we know won't need to go into flour uh that we hopefully can do a good hash uh extract off of um you know that that holds its uh you know might be a good good yielder uh, and then have something to potentially press right into a into a solventless uh solventless extract um but uh you know and then the indoor is going to be focused on the uh on the uh, higher quality definitely i'd say uh, we do a little bit of everything as well uh at vertica we're located in oklahoma so we're we were able to fully vertically integrate and have licenses to cultivate uh process and then uh dispensary license as well so when we're growing our bud, we really have the outlets to do just about whatever we want with it. Uh, obviously, the primo stuff is, is getting trimmed up and goes to uh, flower sales. Our lab's coming online right now, so there is a portion of our stuff that's getting kind of reserved and set aside for that. Uh, we've done a little bit of business with um, a couple extractors here in state. Um, Apothecary Extracts is actually putting out some of our flower really soon that'll be available in our dispensaries. Uh, from some of the stuff we produced in the uh, in the aquaponics here, so we're excited about that. Um, but to answer the question, it is a bit of everything. We've got some stuff that's going flower, some for extract, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, let me let me ask you guys this question: um, Why would someone, or what is your opinion? You know, everyone here is a pretty experienced aquaponic cannabis grower. Why should someone that's maybe doing soil right now, uh, you know, consider uh, adding aquaponics as part of their grow operation or switching their operation over? Uh, uh, you know, you guys all have experience doing quite a few different things. Why should someone switch if they're currently, you know, have their stuff figured out and they're they're doing their own thing the way that they they've been doing? Well, 
Well, if you, I mean, uh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll go. Um, so I think that you, if you've already got your stuff figured out, then you know I would just say to to grow a small system next to it and make a comparison and see for yourself because I don't out of everyone that's actually taken me up on the offer of doing that um, it has never never gone back I guess is probably the easiest way to put it so I think that uh, um, other than some living soil people I would say you know I'd combine it you know we'll add stuff to it but I feel like that the terpene expression or, or probably just overall genetic expression is um, it is greater in an aquaponic system, especially if you're doing indoor uh, or like hydro, because you, you have so much little microbial pressure um, that you just don't get the same amount of genetic expression that's triggered by the same diversity of microbes. So I think that, uh, you know, if you're not willing to take the step of putting in a system and comparing it yourself, you know, like maybe you start studying someone like Elaine Ingram or someone like that, that, uh, you know, can help you understand the um, importance of like nutrient density, not only in food, but also cannabis, um, you know, for growth and health and yield and all those different things, you know, sustainability, water usage, kind of depends on what you're comparing it against. There are a lot of uh, advantages depending on what you're comparing it against, but it's got a lot of sustainability, um, definitely quality, uh, I think is, uh, is way up there. We've talked about, you know, terpene and cannabinoid production. Steve's talked about, you know, increased uh, CBD and um, other types of cannabinoid production. Uh, I just think that there are a lot of upsides to it. If you want to talk about production value, I think it's an uh, extremely forgiving method of growing, uh, especially if you talk about watering. If you're trying to teach a new person how to water uh, a plant, it can be very difficult uh, to do as opposed to in a dual root zone system, you can, or even a, just a straight aquaponic system. It goes in and it, it just takes up as much water as it needs and you can manage the system as a whole and not worry about a newbie that um, you know, having to learn how to water a plant because it's much more difficult. So I think it all depends on what you're comparing it to and what aspect because there's a lot of advantages, but those are the ones off the top of my head. Those were some uh, great points. And I'd uh, say if you're really looking to push the limit of what's possible, aquaponics, uh, it's like we're just scratching the surface here and uh, there's so much to learn and so much to uh, improve on it and the results that uh, we're already seeing and the benefits you can get with very small inputs when the whole system's uh, together is just fantastic. What's, how big is the aquaponics ecosystem in agriculture? Like, is it, is it growing exponentially? Is it, uh... Like, is it lettuce farming? Is it everything? Is it like what's sure, the so, current state of aquaponics outside of cannabis? It's growing, growing sure, so, sure. So, so currently aquaponics is expanding rapidly. In fact, uh, thanks to the, uh, the, the current um, uh, global uh, pandemic there, uh, um, it's really seen a surge. I know most of the aquaponic companies that I'm aware of with, that do vegetables have seen at least a twofold increase in, um, you know, customers across the board in terms of people that want new systems or you know need support for their systems. Uh, so that's been booming. But in terms of commercial, it's mainly lettuce and leafy green production, nitrogen heavy production uh, plants, um, because you know, up, honestly, up until maybe five years ago, there wasn't really the high level research that had been done to do flowering crops and to support you know, something that's heavy feeding as, as cannabis or something like that, you know, no people hadn't flushed out silica and the importance of that and some of the other uh, nutrient levels that, and other nutrient importances that were maybe completely overlooked when it was first done just for lettuce, right? Because lettuce doesn't take hardly any nutrients to grow versus cannabis, which takes a lot of nutrients to go, which we all know, right? So 
developing that. And I was I had the pleasure of working for the aquaponic source back um, well, under Sylvia Bernstein when she first owned it. And we did a lot of research under how to make aquaponic systems more profitable. What plants can we grow? What medicinal herbs? What can we grow for profit? And what, what types of things can we do to make it more profitable? So um, we were able to do a lot of different types of research with, with different mycorrhizal fungi. We did a lot of cool research around uh, how to grow osha root, which is a, a almost exclusively wild crafted a medicinal herb that we were able to grow at quite a large scale commercially in, in a greenhouse year round uh, because we realized that it has a very water loving mycorrhizal fungi that actually loves uh, aquaponics, but you have to seed the microbe from a, from a wild population. So we went, found a place where there was some osha root, gathered the the mycorrhizae, seeded it into a wicking bed, and we were able to replicate those conditions and actually grow a plant that is almost exclusively wild crafted. So uh, there's a lot of potential for, for the uh, aquaponics to, able to, to be able to provide ability to grow a lot of agricultural crops that aren't <laughs> traditionally able to be profitable. Uh, there's a woman that I know, it's in Italy, that, that's doing um, uh, a saffron, and she's getting four flushes a year of saffron. Okay, and she's putting the plant, the bulbs right next to each other in media beds. And, and, and you know, who thought growing saffron in aquaponics would be profitable, but there's a lady in Italy that's making it profitable. So there, there's a, a niche market for a lot of these things because of the accelerated growth rate and other things that you can actually make a profit on if you can find essential oil producing plants or other plants you know, and spices uh, or medicinal herbs uh, that, that are used for it. I also know in India, they use it for um, uh, skin stuff. Uh, they actually grow aquaponic cucumbers and because of the accelerated growth rate, they actually use it for pharmaceutical production for topicals. So, uh, you know, there's all different types of, of ways that aquaponics is really changing the world and, and, and utilizing the benefits of it uh, as well. But, um, uh, in, in the space, not only just with cannabis, but also other vegetables. I know, uh, uh, I know Baines worked at one of the largest or organic certified vegetable uh, facilities in all of North America. And I know uh, some of the other guys here have some experience as well in the aquaponics. I know uh, uh, Tanner in particular has grown quite a few vegetables in aquaponics as well. And you got uh, Superior Fresh down in the, uh, down in the States. And <clears throat> when, I, when, I, uh, when I look at the growth of the aquaponics uh, movement uh globally I, I like to look at the two industries you know separately when you just talk about land-based fish farming as a whole entity onto itself uh, what what you're seeing and what you're going to be seeing is mass migration uh of uh seafood onto into land-based fish farms as conditions worsen uh you know for offshore fish farming operations so you've got this you're going to have this new influx of animal agriculture moving on to land and a and right now it, the manure is just dumped uh into the ocean so now you've got this additional uh nutrient supply so that i mean a ninety thousand metric ton per year fish farm is being built in florida uh a salmon farm atlantic salmon as as we speak uh so that's the largest land-based fish farm uh in the world that, that's getting getting built right now so and, and with all the food security uh, <laughs> uh, thought process that the world is going through now, Steve, as, as you brought up, um, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> if I, how, you know, how can I create the uh, densest amount of protein with the least amount of input uh, in a, in a uh, area or a volume? And that's fish. Like, you, you know, when you're talking from a protein uh, perspective, uh, you know, a lot of the, like the fish we're growing in a, in a well-balanced uh, fish farm or any good fish farmer has got a one, like a 1 1.1 to one conversion rate. So it's almost a pound in to a pound of meat uh, out. Uh, so, you know, aquaponics is uh, the resource to just tie uh, a, a really valuable nutrient source into uh into your plant production facilities and and, and in a safer way right because you know uh, uh fish manure doesn't have uh, as much risk for uh, e coli as a warm-blooded animal does so like from that's more from a food perspective uh, i mean it's from both right but <laughs> but more from a or more from a leafy green uh, perspective on the fish side. So, you know, massive growth in land-based fish farming, massive growth 
in indoor agriculture and uh, our industry is growing right along with it because we're filling the gap. On top of the food scarcity, scarcity in the world, we also have a water scarcity going on. And with aquaponics, with our current system right now, we're recycling 99% of that water. And we also uh, firmly believe we'd be able to get that up to 99.99 with uh, capturing that through evapotranspiration. So on top of the benefits of providing both leafy greens and protein, you're also uh, very little water use to be able to do that, which is so cool. It's basically if shit goes real bad, be close to an aquaponics facility and bring the guns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you can, and if you're if you're properly dosing with your probiotics, I know, uh, and we'll we'll touch on this in a second. But if you're properly dosing with probiotics, you can drink that water. Like it's it's I, I would happily drink water out of any aquaponic system that I work on because we dose probiotics that eliminate anything that's going to make me sick. So, um, uh, and 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 but absolutely, you know, I work with people in Barbados. I've worked with people in Jamaica, and they don't have that much water annually right? Or Australia, they don't have a lot of water annually. So aquaponics provides a wonderful way. Yes, you do need to have an initial large <laughs> amount of water. But aside from that initial large amount of water, your 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 day to day is just what the plants are uptaking minus a small amount of evaporation. And if you're recapturing that in the air, uh, you know, you, you can put that right back in your system. I know uh, you do have to be careful, though, because some uh, dehumidifiers can leach things like zinc, you know, stay away from zinc uh, um, uh, collect collectors. <laughs> But um, yeah, the zinc collectors uh, copper as well is another one. Yep, yep. So so try to stay to the aluminum if you're gonna get a collector uh, or, or uh, heat exchange or not heat exchanger. What do they call them? Radiators. Uh, make sure that they have uh, aluminum ones because those ones can actually be used uh, in the aquaponic system without having any kind of headache. Uh, we use the um, uh, the Quest ones and and we don't really have too much of a problem here uh, at least at our current facility. Um, so, uh, what if any Korean natural farming or other probiotic inputs are you guys using? Um, I'm a big fan of lactobacillus bacteria. I know that uh, a friend of mine, Joe Pate over at Kentucky state university did a research project where they actually looked at, uh, using lactobacillus uh, uh, acid bacteria in order to, uh, eliminate pathogens as well as accelerate plant growth and fish growth. Uh, and they had all kinds of cool results. I don't know if that white paper has been released yet, but if it hasn't, it will be, uh, this year. Um, uh, are you, what kind of, uh, uh, things are you guys doing for those types of inputs? Uh, I, I'm right there with you on the, uh, lactic acid bacteria. We like to do that a whole bunch. We'll dose both on the systems and then spray that, uh, as a preventative for, uh, certain foliars, uh, to prevent PM and stuff like that. Uh, in addition to the labs, we also do an FPJ that uh, will, uh, just as part of our routine trimming and stuff like that, we'll take that and make the fermented plant juice from it and add that in with our compost teas and stuff like that, just to give it a little extra zing. Um, we currently, I just got my boxes made today to put out an additional uh, IMO collection to get that whole process started and taking that all the way to the uh, liquid IMO, although we haven't done that one just quite yet in uh, at our farm. What about it? What about anybody else? Well, yeah, I mean, definitely labs. You know, I, I think that we talked about it pretty early on after we started using it. <laughs> I think I originally picked it up years ago in the um, Probiotic Farmers Alliance Facebook group. So shout out to those guys. Got a lot of good good info there. And uh, so that was kind of where I started into like the fermenting and KNF. Uh, realm and so I, I had made some labs and I dosed it in a couple of different things and um, I had spilled some on some filter paper that I, I had pulled out of something and a couple of days later it had like eaten almost everything off the filter paper and was relatively clean again and so I actually started dosing it in uh, in my beds around that time as opposed to just in my tanks and seeing the benefits of the solids break down inside of my beds and I think I ran the last system I had down there for uh, almost two years I think uh, between uh, complete bed clean outs and uh, even when I cleaned it out then it was uh, for the move 
it really was doing just fine. So I've been able to use labs and other micro experiments uh, that really um, increase microbial density and uh, variety to help break down solids in my system as opposed to using filtration. So I really had a, a lot of good luck with that. At today's date, we are uh, not doing any microbial inputs in uh, our system. Given the mineralization process we have, that's uh, our digesters, our big micro area where it's really breaking down the solids that's coming in from the salmon side and then making sure we're really filtering that water out before it ends up uh, heading over to the plant side. But uh, we want to really push the limits of what's possible with the uh, aquatic microbial life from our coho salmon and then down the road take a look at how we can continue to improve. Very cool. Um, uh, we actually do both IMO collections uh, in terrestrial and aquatic uh, biomes here, uh, and then uh, use those for, for any time we do nutrients, we'll make a, a light compost tea to make sure that those nutrients have the microbes that they, they need to get into the plant very quickly. Uh, and that's how we address all of our stuff. So we also do lactobacillus aside from our IMO. And then I've also been, um, and we can roll into to pest management is, um, we, we, I've had a huge amount of luck with, with this new methodology or newer ish methodology of, uh, doing a, an IMO collection using insect frass. So we'll actually do a typical IMO collection as you would with a, with traditional IMO, uh, in Korean natural farming, where you take your rice, you cook it and you put it in a box in the forest. Uh, but we actually take a third of that and actually put insect frass in it and then do two thirds rice with one third insect frass, mix that all together, then cook it. Uh, do it in a not your kitchen. Uh, you will regret it if you do that. Um, <laughs> not the best smelling stuff, but uh, you put it out in your box and you'll actually collect your uh, um, shatan feeding microbes that love to feed on those exoskeletons of those plants. So, or the insects rather. So uh, you can spray that on your plants in a liquid IMO form, either from an IMO two or an IMO three or four, depending on how, what, what you're going to make your liquid IMO from. And, and actually use that as, as one of the best ways to mitigate caterpillars, grasshoppers, aphids, uh, and as a general pest management spray, particularly when I was over in Africa, we didn't have access to any pest management. I could get beneficial insects. Sometimes it comes on time. Sometimes it takes a month and a half, right? It's, it's just completely inconsistent. And it's not like in the West. Uh, sprays are, are kind of, you know, paraquat. You can still be bought in the country to give you an idea where they are on sprays. So uh, they don't have anything I can buy there. So we had to come up with our own solutions for big scale uh, uh, mitigation on a way that's not going to kill my fish or deal with anything else. So that was some of the solutions that we came up with and uh, have worked very, very well for us. But um, aside from beneficial instead, what are you doing for your pest management practices? Uh, that, that's kind of what I do. My stuff is a beneficial probiotic for the, um, uh, the fungal and then uh, beneficial insects for the insect control. So what are you guys doing for pest management? Um, uh, aquaponics kind of has this forced honesty because of the fish being part of the, uh, a component of the system. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing, uh, we're just doing a full, uh, full IPM. So integrated, integrated pest management, so all, all beneficial insects, um, you know, hanging the bag, <laughs> hanging, hanging the thrip killers on, on the plants when they get just big enough and, uh, pouring the grubs, uh, or, you know, or the, the uh, predators into the soil. And, uh, and I kind of like that, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I almost noticed, uh, you know, when we first transferred our plants into the room and then I brought in the integrated pest management, I just, it did change the, the, the room a bit, you know, the plants, plants seem to, uh, uh, you know, react to the entry uh, of, uh, of those beneficials. So, you know, it's, uh, it's the only way to go. Yeah, I totally agree. We, we lean pretty heavy on our, uh, on our beneficial bugs. We have a whole variety of different predatory mites we'll put down from uh, the Swarskis in the little bags, like you're talking about. Uh, we'll do um, our persimilis and in in either a broadcast or a spot treatment for, uh, for 
if we ever get any spider bites or anybody else kind of breaking out. Um, <clears throat> we lean pretty heavy on our rove beetles for keeping the soil all cleaned up. Uh, between them and the H miles, we're able to do a pretty good job of that. We've also got nematodes that we're throwing in on in the mix on the soil layer. Um, let's see, we've also got a couple of parasitic wasps out for both of our, our moth eggs. And then we also have a couple of the nice. parasitic wasps that go after the aphids as well as so some of the uh, aphidious family, I believe it is, uh, that we incorporate into our IPM. Uh, that pretty much rounds up most of the bugs. I know I'm missing a couple that we've got sprinkled in there, certainly for spot treatment. Uh, and then we'll rely on a couple of biologic sprays. I know we had talked about labs and then um, we do a product called Cease, which is a Bacillus subtilis that we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of success with on fighting different uh, things like PM in the greenhouse when we get a, a little outbreak of that and then uh, preventatively, of course, as well. Yeah, all, all beneficial bugs here, um, you know, mostly a lot of, uh, you know, if we do have issues, it's a lot of defoliating and, you know, re repurposing bugs. I really like having the pouches um, or the, the hanging cards for lace wings or just some of those that you can move around if you do get problem areas to kind of rally the troops a little bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for the most part, like even the, uh, I think it took me about two two runs of constantly pushing beneficial insects, um, you know. So lacewing, you know, Californicus, Persimilis mites, um, rove beetles, pyra bugs. Um, so I, the only thing that I would say about that is, is make sure that you you have effective bugs for, you know, if you're outdoor, definitely your, your time of year, your temperature, your humidity. Um, some of those parasitic wasps are only effective at certain stages. You know, they're, you know, some of them are going to infect just the eggs. So for, you need to release those, you know, early. And a lot of times you can like uh, work with your local uh, agriculturalist to be able to kind of understand when, about when those cycles are and kind of cover those in the most effective time. But really it's all it comes down to environment. You want to set them up to be um, you know, as successful as possible um, and, and outnumber them, you know, run. It's not just releasing bugs and hanging pouches. I think, it, you know, that's where a lot of people kind of uh, um, go astray with beneficial insects is that um, if you pick one that's not set for your environment, then they're all just going to die off um, or leave, try and go somewhere else. Uh, you know, they don't get enough of them and they don't monitor it moving forward. Um, you know, you got to check and make sure that your your populations are, are in check. You know, I like to maintain a four to one beneficial and uh, non-beneficial ratio. So if I pull a leaf off of my grow and I look at the bottom of it, I want to see at least four good bugs for every bad bug, ideally. And if I don't, then I want to release more, um, you know, whether that's what type or what it is. I usually do a rotation. So lace wings are kind of all my, my generalists. You know, they're kind of always out there, <clears throat> but they don't reproduce really well. So they kind of always need to be released. So luckily they're relatively inexpensive. <clears throat> I try to keep my humidity up and in check for BPD anyway. So usually like the Persimilis or Californicus mites here you know, are my go-to for like a, just your two spotted mites. And then you got your uh, H miles, rove beetles that I like for your root zone areas. Um, so I, I try to cover, uh, you know, each area separately. So, you know, the media beds, the dual root zone layer with the soil uh, and the, the canopy up above. I try to separate predators into each one of those areas so they don't, they don't over compete. There's always that perimeter up for anything around. So what are um what are some of the uh, uh, oh, hold on I think closed here one second I'm trying to juggle everything I had a problem with my internet here for a second 
Um, what are some of the uh, advice you have for someone that might want to get started in aquaponics? Be sure you want to look after fish. It's probably... Uh... <laughs> Start with feeder goldfish. I would say, like, if I could, like, give one piece of advice, I guess it would be that, you know, uh, everybody kills fish, so you might as well kill some cheap ones to start with. Um, you know, Definitely. I wouldn't go buy salmon or, uh, or trout or, you know, prize koi uh, to start your first system ever. Um, you know, and then aside from that, you know, study and learn what you can and then get your hands dirty and mess something up and learn from that. Actually, can I add a twist to that question, which is I, I feel like Tom is an example of someone who has a fish tank and I feel like millions of people have fish tanks or little koi ponds kind of in like a pimp my fish tank concept. <laughs> Can you jerry rig your average, you know, 30, 50 gallon fish tank to suddenly start producing lettuce or so when I talk to when I talk to fish tank people or aquaculturists or whatever you want, fish keepers, you guys have all kinds of names. But when I try to relate aquaponics to you guys, I, I try to think of it like this. Imagine your media bed is your biofilter. And then you just grow stuff out of your biofilter because almost a lot of a lot of people are familiar. If you have fish tanks, you're familiar with with a biofilter, um, you know. So, which is essentially using microbes uh, in the same way that we do in an aquaponic system to clean water. And then the only difference being is that we don't have to necessarily um, uh, change out the water once the nitrates build up too high in your system, which you normally do. Uh, with a biofilter system at some point, you would have to clean those out. But ta-da, we have plants. Uh, so we manage the plants, which ultimately take that out. So if you wanted to <clears throat> just take a fish tank and um, add a media bed to it, uh, remove any other biofilters that you have attached to it, or maybe even transplant, if it's got media in it, then you can uh, transplant some of that to a media bed. But you can add a media bed um, as long as you uh, you know, are able to get your plants uh, <clears throat> into the media bed and get your water in there, cycle it. You can do it with a timer. You can do it with a U-siphon. You can do it with a bell siphon. There's tons of videos about how to build those things, but essentially a siphon system just fills it up and drains it out. You can do the same thing with a timer. Um, but yeah, just add a media bed and some plants to your average fish tank and uh, you could scoop water out of it and pour it in there a few times a day and it would probably still grow most plants. Um, so it's very flexible. Uh, if you want them to grow fast, then a siphon system that constantly siphons water through is a great thing to have. Um, and it will definitely boost growth rates, but there's plenty of NFT systems and constant flow systems and stuff that will work for a while and generally have their own issues. But uh, if you're just looking to grow lettuce, it's a lot easier than trying to grow like something like cannabis that will take a little bit longer. You can usually grow lettuce in what, you know, three weeks, four weeks, something like that. Yeah, four weeks, yeah. So, so uh, I, we, we did a whole bunch of research around this particular topic when I was at Aquaponics first. And um, you really need about 40 or 50 gallons of fish tanks in order to actually grow a cannabis plant with the aquaponics in terms of having enough fish biomass to make enough nutrients to feed the plant. Um, but the easiest way for most people, if you have an aquarium, is get a hang on the back filter box or, or an overflow box, as they like to call them. And then simply just run that uh, to, uh, you know, a tough tote or whatever your sump is to your flood and drain table in your grow tent or, or your, you know, normal flood and drain tables in your room. And then, you know, you, you know you're good to go. You run a return to the fish tank. You run one off to your bed, uh, either on a, on a timer or on a... Uh, uh, flood and drain or like marty said with a either a bell siphon which was first invented by pythagoras it was originally called the pythagorean cup or the greed cup if people uh 
put too much wine in their cup, it would spill the wine through the stem all over them. So that was a, the original invention, but we, today we use them for our flood and drain beds. Or you can use loop siphons, which are another way, way to do it, which is an external siphon type, uh, which can be a little bit easier. Uh, and you also will actually let you do a larger bed. So loop siphons, you can actually do up to 120 square feet, whereas um, bell siphons, you know, a, a one inch bell siphon really kind of tops out, out at around 48 to 50 uh, square feet in terms of uh, flood and drain space, assuming you're doing a, you know, eight to 12 inch uh, deep bed. Yeah, and that, that quite often is the, you know, biggest hurdle in a, in a proper entry uh, for a nutrient thirsty plant into aquaponics as a whole is that minimum, the minimum amount of fish, right? And that's, uh, uh, that's the issue you run into when you're, when you're converting your, your home tanks and it just comes down to feed conversion rate to uh, quantity quantity of plants but you know a great a great way to great way to test test out aquaponics though is to is to grow a different plant to start try it out requires less nutrient then upgrade your fish Oh yeah, and that's, that's definitely something like you guys were saying earlier, definitely don't start off with expensive fish, start off with cheaper ones, koi and tilapia, both, uh, you know, harder to kill. And, and then once you know what you're doing, then complicate it, you know, make your life harder after you've gotten everything else running smoothly. Same thing with organic certification. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it can be really hard to get organic certified right out the bat. Uh, especially if you've never done it before, uh, you know, design your system so it can be organically certified, get up and running, get cash flow, and then move into the organic certification uh, rather than trying to dive into it. Because again, in, in cannabis right now, the increase in price point simply doesn't really justify the amount of additional headache and labor that it puts onto your team. And what about anyway. food for your, uh, for your uh, home system? Yeah, breeder Steve was talking about don't feed them shit fish food. <laughs> yeah, that's super important because you you are what you eat eat. So whatever you're putting through that that fish, I mean, when you're eating when you're eating food, it's more relevant, right? Um, I mean, you're still smoking uh, a, a flower uh, that would be grown with the lesser nutrients, so it might not perform as well. So so that's kind of a difficulty too if you're doing a smaller system, but you can always get a bag of good stuff uh, from a larger uh, fish farmer, right? To feed your fish. Go going down the line, uh, starting with Steve, what's like a, a, what's a high level intellectual conversation slashed, like you could either be agreeing with someone, like something you want to explore, research, test, or having a debate with someone on your team, someone else in the aquaponics community, kind of like what in the past couple of weeks or couple of days have you been having intense conversations with some, like, what was the topic and what, and, and who are you talking with and what was the topic? So I've been I've been working on an aquaponic cannabis book uh, to put out later in the year or beginning of next year. And uh, one of the rabbit holes that I've been working on for uh, quite a quite a while and Bain knows this because he's seen quite a bit firsthand and Martin as well um, is looking at ferments and Korean natural farming as a way to replace mineral input. So growing things like stinging nettle for silica over uh, what is traditionally people consider like horsetail being your high cycle. Well, actually stinging nettle is like eight times the level of silica. So you know, looking at doing individual FPJs that we can use in place of our bottle nutrients or our mineral salts or, or the, you know, uh, I like to call it, collectively call them the baby bottles uh, <laughs> um, and moving towards a way that can be both used in uh, uh, not only aquatics with fish, but also in soil and mapping that out. I think that 
um, that there's so much need need for research. And that's really been a rabbit hole that I've been kind of jumping down uh, quite a bit for, for quite a while. And, and especially lately, uh, really fine tuning it uh, to try and give people, you know, a top 10 or 15 options for, for plants when they're trying to boost individual nutrients uh, in a way that's not going to also kill their fish uh, that they can pour in the water and, and, and replace maybe a potassium silicate or a calcium carbonate or a, a magnesium sulfate or a uh, um, uh, sodium molybdenate with, uh, you know, a plant-based input instead. So that's, that's been really the thing that I've been jamming on hardcore and, and, and uh, uh, that and endophytes. I, I, I seriously can't read enough on endophytes. Talk about endophytes. Tell us about them. Oh yeah. So endophytes, uh, and this is where something that I think, especially in aquaponics, I think is, is really good long-term going to be one of the areas where they, they really make a lot of major discoveries is, is that what aquatic endophytes, uh, are, are the cannabis plants adapting from the aquaponics that aren't existing in our terrestrial plants uh, and, and what, what direct uh, gene expression and terpene expressions are they causing that that do not exist in terrestrial soil and again that that goes back to what i was talking about earlier with with a place for biotech to really move in and and, and actually make a profitable product and, and fund this research you know if you found something in there you could fund you know 10 years of research you know or more uh, uh, to keep going down that rabbit hole. And I think that really is an area that uh, not only would provide enormous impact for people in the cannabis industry, but allow people around the world. I just came back from Zimbabwe, right? Do you think they have money for, for, for buying MPK at the store? Of course they don't, right? They make their own stuff. They make their own pesticides. They make their own you know, composted nutrients. They, they, they take their own cattle manure. They've shoveled into an area. They, they put that on their fields. You know, like they, they're very conscious about that. So we, we can take this and actually make, a, make it and amplify it and spread this as a way that we can use across the world for not only cannabis, but other crops as well. And I know there's lots of soil people that are, are, are jumping down that rabbit hole, but I haven't heard a lot of people that actually try to take the Korean natural farming way of of using the Korean natural farming microbial complexes for mineral isolation in the context of the um, bioaccumulators and hybridizing them with the bioaccumulator charts and then mapping that out as far as, hey, what actually does come out really good in a ferment uh, that it stays bioavailable and what doesn't. And I think that that is an area that there's immense room for research that, that will not, not only benefit aquaponics, but also benefit the soil realm as well. Uh, not, not, for, not only for cannabis, but for, for broad food production. KNF, correct? Oh yeah, I'm friends with uh, Chris Trump and, and Eric Weiner. So, so basically, uh, Kevin Jodry uh, made a joke that I thought was actually pretty on point. Like when he was in Colombia, you know, there every local, you know, area region of the world essentially has their own version of what we in America call KNF. So he was like, yeah, they do Colombia natural farming. So can you talk about, is there anything you picked up in Zimbabwe where like you connected the dots of these isolated spots in the globe, Korea, somewhere in South America, Zimbabwe, where you're like, oh my God, like they're doing something, they're calling it different things. They've never spoken to anybody in Korea, but like, I see, I see connections around the world. So I didn't see it so much in Zimbabwe, but I definitely saw it in Jamaica. So uh, people are familiar with labs and they're familiar with FPJ. Well, they kind of combine the two into one product in Jamaica. So they'll take a 55 gallon drum, they'll take milk or uh, a cow milk or goat milk, and they'll put it into the drum. And then they'll take uh, fruit skins, usually sweet sop or sour sop, and put them in the barrel. They'll, they, you know, they'll eat the fruit and take the pits and the skins and they'll put them in there and they'll ferment that. Uh, for up to 30 days, 24 to 30 days. And then they use that as a finisher to make the, to increase terpene production. And, and that is something that, you know, that was developed either in somewhere in, in far uh, uh, Western Africa or in the Caribbean, right? Uh, that methodology, but that is very similar in methodology to, K, to what we understand as KNF. Uh, um, one of the other things that I found is, is really interesting too is that you know KNF is really cool, but we need to kind of uh, we could capitalize and maximize and min max that. For instance, labs. Uh, everyone likes to do the traditional uh, rice water collection. Well, 
what actually works even better than that, significantly better, is if you use kefir, uh, uh, milk kefir, because it has significantly higher levels of vitamin B and a much wider range of vitamin B complexes, which the plants love. You'll get a huge increase in, in, in growth rate because of those uh, vitamin Bs being able to provide it in a way that the plants can actually uh, readily uptake again. So th there's a lot of stuff where you can take the methodology from that, but we could perfect it if we just take a little bit of science and overlay it. The same way with, we didn't quite understand what terpenes were back in the day, but we knew that the smells and just certain smells helped people with certain things more. Then we learned about terpenes, then we learned about CBD and, and all this other stuff. And, and, and you know, we did, the more we have the science to teach us why things are working, the more we can kind of uh, increase that. And, and there's so little research done with, with uh, around a, a, so much of that realm because it's been new or it's been illegal or or people just haven't taken it seriously. And, and remember before the, before the depression, everyone did natural farming, right? We didn't have any mineral salts. There was no petroleum based stuff before the 1920s, right? So uh, 1910. So uh, we just kind of need to go back to how we used to grow. And, and I remember my grandparents grew up during the depression and we made our own, uh, we cut willows cuttings and, and put that in, in sunflower oil and make our own cloning gel and all kinds of things like that. So this is to and ferment our own uh, uh, tomato leaves to, to kill the aphids and the Japanese beetles. And, and this is all stuff that is very in line with, with what a lot of people are doing that stuff what my grandparents were doing, right? So this is just, we have to kind of get back to the way that we used to grow because it worked for thousands of years, right? We didn't have that other than when weather got out of control, this stuff worked. Right. So and, and and to further go back, look at the Vikings and how they preserved the microbes in the horns. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where they'd hollow out uh, uh, d um, cow horns. And then the, when the, the fall, they'd save the best soil and put it in there and bury it deep underground. And they dig them up and use them to sprinkle on their garden. And they get actually a, 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 an extra a, almost month of growth rate out of their plants uh, in, in Europe. So it was one of the things that actually allowed the Vikings to spread as far as they did. So. Um, uh, you know, the, but they and they they knew it was like the the earth spirits or whatever, right? But it's actually the the soil microbes that they were they were they were preserving and keeping them from getting too cold and dying off or becoming into that permanently dormant state. So, uh, we've been doing a lot of things that we traditionally think of as very modern that aren't modern at all. You know, we've been doing them for a very long time. We just think of them in in a certain context as being a new a new thing. And, you know, even aquaponics, you know, going back to the chinampas in Mexico, uh, the, the very first aquaponics that anyone ever did were the chinampas in, in, in the Mexico City, right? So uh, even aquaponics isn't that new of an idea, you know, it's at least 3000 years old or 2000 years old. All right, Tanner, what about you? What, what's a vigorous dialogue, debate, or a green conversation you've had with someone on your team in the past uh, week or so? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, for for uh, for us right now, uh, our our number one focus is finding that perfect, you know, those those uh, perfect strain combos with uh, with what we have going on in our soil. But everything everything we're doing in our farm is completely research based. So this is why uh, this is why Steve and I. Uh, get along so well um you know i got two plant scientists uh coming in hot uh right now and uh for for us it's all about the microbes so you know if i was to put a skewer uh through the middle of uh you know our our mission long term it's just to completely understand uh living soil uh and the microbial cultures that kind of occur in there and that expression and strains uh to uh, microbes generated out of an aquaponics uh, system and and how that how that translates and you know how deep how deep into the microbiome uh, can we can we dig uh, with uh, uh, you know with with our control of what goes in there and and what kind of uh, uh, you know nirvana or you know for lack of a better word can we create uh, out of a strain getting getting down and in, into that and then you know can that have some major medical benefits uh out out the other end as well you know how does that how does that affect uh you know if, if it if it's translated from cannabis into an extract or whatever it is um this is really long term uh but but uh, but what would that what would that look like uh in in 
their microbiome. So it's like, you know, we farm three things, man. We farm plants, fish, and microbes. And, uh, you know, it's a nice kind of focal point for us. But around that, <clears throat> around that, we build everything else. You know, what's the, uh, what is the, uh, what is the optimum uh, fish feed? You know, what's the sustainability uh, component of that? Where's, where do those ingredients uh, come from? Can we pull that, can we pull that closer in house uh, and, and, and localize it uh, a bit more and, and, uh, you know, kind of go from there. So it's just this balance of, you know, finding, finding an optimized, uh, all optimized genetics in, in a aqua, aquaculture setting, uh, uh, combined with, uh, energy management. So, so what are you exploring with fish feed? I mean, what, one of the interesting things, uh, I got from our conversation with, uh, Steve with breeder, Steve was, well, two things. One was the diversity of, of, uh, fish that he wanted in his system. He didn't just want all one type of fish. I mean, he has crocodiles and all <laughs> sorts of fish. And, and then also just kind of what he's feeding, you yeah. know, the carnivores and the herbivores. Yeah. Uh, so, so what are you exploring with what you're feeding the fish, which then in turn feed the plants? Yeah. I mean, so, so for us, uh, uh, you know, that that's the starting point, uh, where, whereas, uh, omnivore and a herbivore has a higher higher vegetarian diet so the salts are lower in your fish feed by default um so you know that's that's a pretty good pretty good anchor point uh for us and and having you know having a stabilized fish species to do our to do our research through um that's kind of that's important to us right now uh as well because you know, the more, the more, uh, manure processing machines we add in to the, uh, fertilizer factory, <laughs> the, the, the more variables, uh, that, that, that we have to, uh, try to pin down, uh, on, uh, on feeding nutrients, uh, in, into the, into the plants. But, um, but, but, it, but the fish feed in general, like the starting point is, uh, that to get the protein in most fish feed, it actually comes from uh, fish, so they they put fish that is the off catch of uh, of uh, trawlers into the fish meal. So so that it, <laughs> and then you're feeding you can be feeding a herbivore. That's the the most economical source of protein in that fish feed, and that's how the whole infrastructure of the fish feed industry is built around that as a primary source. So a lot of times. You know, when when you're looking to change that as an example, because you know if you put a bloat fly in place as your protein source in place of uh, actual fish meal, you've got a lower salt, just as high of protein input, but there's not enough bloat fly manufacturing facilities to lower the bloat fly cost, <laughs> so that so that your fish feed doesn't cost you, you know. A gazillion dollars so so this is there, there's so like all the all the enhancements and, and a whole bunch of uh uh nutrient enhancing options are available for fish feed as well right uh you know you can put you can get as fancy as you want with that with that feed and see you know what kind of uh uh improved traits you're getting out of that fish and and get it in your uh, uh fertilizer at the other side but the, you know the 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 availability of feed at a low cost to do those tweaks is something you have to have your eye on all the time. So it's like, you know, you could try to go over here in your feed innovation, but you have to balance that with where your cost um, would go if you uh, found out it worked well. And then you're like, well, it only cost me a thousand dollars a kilogram to, uh, you know, feed my fish. So I'm good. Uh, well, I've, we found, uh, or I've personally found uh, that roaches seem to be the best food for, for scale, um, both dubia, hissing cockroaches, or in the Caribbean, mango roaches, or in Africa, we had this large forest roach. It's very, very closely related. Brunswick. 
Yeah, very closely related to Madagascar, hissing cockroaches there in Zimbabwe. And uh, we can basically, we, we raise them in large top loading freezers. And we put two inches of Vaseline on them and we just get big freezers and we take all of our fan leaves and then leftover smaller stalks and stuff. It goes in there and gets converted into food and their waste is, is significantly well, much better balanced than uh, earthworm castings uh, by volume. So uh, it's definitely been one of the more interesting things, but in terms of something that you can actually generate a lot of in biomass, they are one of the only things that can breed at the rate that you actually need to, to keep up with your fish. Uh, and and uh, something that you can also, you know, if you feed them the right foods, something that you can sterilize and, and get a good culture to have for internal production without having to worry about pathogens or anything else. Do you just so you so, so you're sorry. I was gonna say so so you're you were feeding the roaches. Uh, so basically, they're they're eating plants, and you're feeding them cannabis. Yep. So we we take the, the fan leaves when we do our defoliating. They go into the the bins. They feed the roaches, and then the roaches feed the fish. So pretty simple and we do also do that with worms i know marty also does quite a few different insect production black soldier flies are another really good one they're one of the best calcium to protein rate to fat ratios uh per gram of any insect that you can raise for for chicken or uh, uh, fish feed so um these are all things that can be can be added uh, or raised separately or even off of just your your defoliating production to be frank with you yeah and a lot of them work together like red worms for instance love you know, like the solids that'll come out of your, you know, fruit ferments or vegetable, you know, plant ferments in general, you know, so, and a lot of times in a ferment, I am straining the solids and the solids go to the worm bin and the liquids are then dosed in the aquaponic system. So a lot of times, and, and you'll just see, you know, population growth explode in your red worm bins. Like if you make, uh, like uh, I made a sour plum one one time and I threw the, the solids in there on the worm bin and it just went crazy. I, I posted a picture of it, I think to Instagram and it just, just a sh not like a shovel full of nothing but big fat red worms. And so um, that's one of my, my kids' favorite things to do actually is go pick worms out and toss them to the fish and uh, pretty, pretty good entertainment and, uh, and a great food source too. So. Um, their population can explode really quickly. So definitely, you know, you know I highly recommend both red worms and seems a big proponent of black worms too, right? There's a smaller aquatic worm called black worms that can be amazing for aquaponic systems for breaking up sludge and, and solid waste. They love to feed on anaerobic bacteria. So they'll actually seek out those problem areas in your beds and, and provide aeration uh, kind of automatically uh, as their normal food source. So uh, again, if you're having struggling with with you know, problems with your media beds and things like that, with, with clogging or, or just junk in them, uh, they can be a great way to help keep the system much cleaner uh, without having to actually do much of any actual labor, <laughs> which is always good when you can have a little critters cleaning for you instead of yourself. Uh, always good to pass off that labor to someone else. All right. Well, uh, so, go, ahead. go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say, is there any other uh, things that you guys see as a, as a cost reduction? You know, we talked about how the mineral inputs kind of are supplemented by the, by the uh, revenue that the fish generate for themselves. So there are, are basically our, our fertilizers generating revenue uh, to help pay for itself. Is there any other um, uh, ways that you guys have found that aquaponics does provide a, a lower overhead costs compared to other things aside from just the reduced water usage and the, the minerals being a less money per run? Well, I think kind of tying back to his question before about like what, what have I, what, what have I been debate about been recently, which is a lot of it has been around, um, I would say, uh, the nutrient versus micro discussion in which I feel like we already have some studies that, that are pretty solid in saying that, you know, increased microbial diversity, diversity will make better use of fewer nutrients to grow the same or even better production and even plants other than cannabis. So I'm, we've understand that we can, that we can move the needle. Like we've, we've figured that out, but really dialing that into, you know, what, what is really driving growth? How, you know, 
is there like a 60 40 mix in here like what is it so like in my current grow in, in my, my test grow right now I, I did you know varying levels of potassium and phosphorus inputs and trying to uh, really figure out um, what what is the really driving factor or what ratio is best to, to get the best growth specifically for cannabis. Is that different for different plants or or how does that work? But we, I feel like we're, we're just starting to understand that, uh, that microbes play a huge part in plant growth and health and um, performance, like all of those things that we, uh, that we care about as, as farmers. Um, we, we already know that we've been probably feeding too many nutrients as opposed, and not enough microbes and really closing that gap, find out uh, what difference there is. Because in, in my current grow, I can definitely see that obviously you can't, uh, you know, you can't, I don't feel like you can get top level performance from a singular nutrient, single nutrient profile all the way through the entire grow. Um, so I, I would say that's probably my my biggest debate right now with myself <laughs> and then uh the biggest debate i have with other people is um i would say about uh, with living soil people it's always about aquaponics being something besides living soil and so um or aquaponics people that say that soil has no place in uh in aquaponics you know it's kind of the, the zealotry from both sides like that's probably the always the heated debate that I get. And I, I honestly just feel like if you're coming from a living soil background, I, my, my only pitch to you is that you guys talk about biomimicry all the time, right? Like we, we want to replicate what happens in nature. We want to grow our cover crops and have them cut down and recycle all that stuff through. Okay, that's great. But when does somebody come through with a hand watering can and water everything? Because I don't, I don't feel like that's where most of sustained plant growth happens. It's, uh, it's around aquatic systems that are fed through underground water sources, like, you know, anything that's going to be sustained through a full season and get to a, a large size and be, uh, uh, and thrive is going to thrive around an aquatic water system as opposed to just surviving off of rainwater. Um, so I, I view aquaponics, especially dual root zone aquaponics is sort of just the next step in evolution of, of how to water living soil in a, in a similar way that we do in nature, which is filtering it through aquatic life systems to, uh, to help maintain healthy microbial life um, and not have to manage our soil my, microbials uh, in the same way that, that we do everything else on, on an extended level. So we can, we can use a water system to help feed our living soil in the same way on, a, on another level of bio, biomimicry or what I just feel like is further towards what people want to do, that those, those water systems already exist in, um, in nature, that we can copy them in the same way that you want to copy everything else. Um, Let's just extend that same line of thinking towards water systems and graduate away from, you know, things like, uh, you know, drip systems or watering systems or things that arguably don't don't exist in nature and continue that same thought process that we do with soil and just carry that through to water and throw in some aquatic life. And I feel like it, it fits in really well and most people that, that make the jump don't don't go back. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anybody that's uh, gotten advice and done aquaponics and dual root zone and um, said, you know what, I really want to go back to my DWC hydro days and uh, and buy nutrients and because that just worked a lot better for me. It just it hasn't happened yet, but if it ever does, you know, I'll let you know. And the man in the dark. So I spent a, a lot of time around water quality and really understanding our system 
and uh, what water quality we're getting, which is why we do a lot of testing on the the whole system, but the plant site, understanding exactly what they're taking up, and then uh, touching how can we really mimonize our inputs into the system, which then understands our digester, which is really creating that uh, living water for us, and even how we change the flows or the temperature of that digester, that's gonna be breaking down those solids differently, which then we end up seeing different nutrient profiles coming uh, through our system. So we have got a lot of data to collect and compare uh, where we're at from uh, one cycle to the next. But uh, that is where we uh, spend a lot of time is around our water quality, even the temperature we're running the water at, and all those factors, the microbials we need to dig into more. And uh, yeah, understanding uh, what's happening in that big old digester. And uh, does so Steve's been asking all the questions. Does anyone have any questions for Steve? Steve, you've gone an entire show without talking about silica too much. Are you going to be okay? Yeah, we touched on it a little bit with the with the uh, stinging nettle over the horsetail, which uh, horsetail does have silica in it, but uh, your your stinging nettle has magnitudes more. So if you're after silica, you know, again, go after the stinging nettle, not the horsetail. And, and then as, as a non-aquaponics person, is this stuff then being dumped into the water so that it, it can be absorbed by the plants? Sure. So uh, we'll actually put, uh, you know, the vast majority of things into the water. Um, but if I do need to dose something like potassium or, or uh, something else that might, you know, be remotely uh, fish sensitive, then we can dose, go ahead and dose that through the, the soil zone uh, and the upper half, uh, which we can maintain differently. Um, it also gives us, again, a level of control where we can uh, dose whatever we want. Um, some of the things that you do have to be careful of, though, would be any wetting, agent, ugh, any wetting agents or yucca extract. Yucca extract will kill fish in minuscule doses, like, uh, like uh, two drops in 18,000 gallons, three drops in 18,000 gallons will kill all the fish. So um, those are stuff that we do have to avoid. You dropped in. Oh, no. So actually, for those of you that don't know, if, uh, if you're native, uh, anyone that, that actually uh, has been in Northern California or Oregon knows this, but the Native Americans in Northern California and in Oregon and, and even parts of Nevada would actually take yucca and they'd squeeze the roots and, and c collect the juice into a concentrate and put them into clay vessels. And then they'd evaporate it off to make a, a concentrated form and, and, and concentrate the sapin in, inside the yucca extract and actually pour it into the river uh, and have their tribe go down river about half a mile or a mile and then collect all the fish during the fish run. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, it would dilute down to where it wouldn't hurt anything anymore. And then they just scoop the fish off the surface and, and gut them and dry them and, uh, and away they go and, and doesn't hurt humans at all, you know, as far as cooking it and eating it. So, but yeah, don't use yucca extract or any soil that has it in it. If you're doing aquaponics, you will regret it. I, I get, I get that call at least once every two or three months. I get a phone call about that. But take it fishing with you. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I, you know, I, and Marty, Marty, maybe that's, maybe that's a good, a, a good question is what's some of the really wacky stuff that people have asked you. I've had people ask me if they can use OxyClean in their system. Cause you know, it's got oxygen in it. Right. I've had people ask me if they can pleasure themselves into the tank to feed their baby fish because you know, they're small and they swim and it's something that can oh. feed your fish. I've had people spray Windex on their plants because I don't know, for some reason they read that it's supposed to kill aphids. Like, what are some of the other goofy things that you guys have had uh, in the uh, asked of you? I've gotten more than once for some reason, you know, as soon as they're like, oh, well, if the fish can pee in the tank, can I pee in the tank and make it work? And, and, you know, so, I mean, and then the, like we talked about the, uh, um, does it taste like fish poop or any of those, you know, or do you, do you spray the fish poop on the plants? No, <laughs> we don't. Don't spray the fish poop directly on the plants. Um, you know, some some definite like uh, definite weird weird stuff. Um, yeah, can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but 
I think that um, so many different people try a lot of different things and some really great stuff comes out of it and some really not so great stuff comes out of it. Sometimes it's just, you know, sometimes you end up making labs and it works out great. You're like, well, why would you ferment milk and put it in the aquaponics system? Like sometimes it turns out great. And then other times you end up asking Steve whether or not you can pleasure yourself into a media bed. And maybe you just have to take the good with the bad. I don't know. So just to confirm, none of you are jerking off into your aquaponic systems. No. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, is, yeah, is that person on? I, recommend it. I, I was unclear. I, I heard Bane sneaks into Steve's. But that's, that's a rumor. I don't know. He left early, so he gets kicked on. So it, it is. Are all of you doing dual root zone aqua like uh, soil on top? Are are. Is that I, what you're all doing? I am. I I am not. Our, uh, we do not have fill it soil at our facility. We are uh, just straight roots into the deep water culture. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're, we're soil. Yeah, I think he's the only one that's not utilizing that methodology. So, 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 so in the aquaponics world, kind of what's the like? Are more are most people doing dual root zone? Are most people doing? Oh, I, I, I mean, my, my, my opinion is it's, it's still quite a, quite a mixed bag of, of methodologies and like, you know, people are doing, uh, what, what works well and, and what they're, what they're tuning to their, their, uh, genetics. Right. Um, uh, as well, I think, there, I think that's, that's a lot of it, uh, as well. Right. Like I came out of a nutrient film technique background which was a you know steady steady flow of water cycling through uh, the system at all times and uh, it's got a lot of a lot of great benefits uh, uh to it as well and you can do a lot of good things in a system like that or deep water culture versus dual root zone uh, but it's pretty mixed pretty mixed bag i'd say St or steve correct me if i'm wrong I, I might be off base there but oh so so as far as cannabis goes yeah i think that uh Leanne's the only commercial producer currently not using uh, dual roots and that I'm aware of as far as licensed producers in North America, certainly in North America. I know the only one that's in Switzerland, I know that they're doing dual roots on as well. So um, uh, I know that globally, as far as cannabis goes, uh, uh, that's pretty much been the standard. Um, uh, but as far as regular vegetable production goes, it's pretty rare. Um, people do use it for tomatoes and peppers. Uh, fruit trees are done that way. But uh, outside of those crops, generally people do are cucumbers. Uh, but outside of those crops, generally people do, D, you know, flat DWC or NFT or regular media beds or, or those types of things. Uh, traditionally, the, the dual root zone stuff really uh, is a newer methodology that uh, uh, kind of came about uh, from, from my experimentation out over at uh, the aquaponic source working with a couple of people from Europe and stuff like that. They were tinkering around with cucumber production and uh, we uh, adopted that for cannabis production. And that's actually and, where that came from originally. And so what did you notice that that does better than other techniques? So, so uh, the biggest difference would be one, the, the difference in flavor uh, and then two, the difference in, in nutrient control. Uh, and then three would be the reduction in powdery mildew and surface uh, molds. Uh, huge, huge difference, night and day difference uh, in, in all of our testing with molds, even when we intentionally introduced powdery mildew to the leaf surface uh, in, in testing, at least at the aquaponics source with tomatoes, uh, we were able to notice an, a noticeable uh, boost in mold reduction, which again, in aquaponics, we do have a high, you know, generally we're, we're flirting with the upper end of VPD uh, naturally, unless we're going to really make our uh, humid dehumidifiers run pretty heavily. So, um, you know, we, we tend to not want to uh, give mold uh, any, any chance we can. Uh, keeping silica above uh, six, 65 to 70 parts per million in aquaponics also seems to 
can make an enormous difference in, in mold resistance. Uh, that seems to be a huge threshold right around that 60 ppm level uh, in, uh, aquatically, even for lettuce, uh, for, for botrytis and leaf molds. Uh, it can be a huge, um, a huge reduction in those when you get above that, that uh, you know, 60 to 65 parts per million of silica. So um, uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know we're talking about dual root zone and you know its effectiveness for really for just being able to have an area where you can feed the plant that doesn't you know because the soil layer stays completely separate from the water level and the table you can feed higher levels of nutrients less often so you don't have to feed like say every other day or however often you're feeding your additional nutrients you would have to feed them less often because you could stockpile more nutrients in the dual root zone layer. So um, having grown in both just straight media and dual root zone, you know, I, I was able to reduce the amount of uh, feeding that I had to do down to just a couple of times per cycle in the dual root zone, as opposed to a couple of times a week in uh, just media beds. So it's kind of the, you know, in my opinion, the, the most value is that you can you can dial it in so the system can be your baseline and each plant uh, can have its own nutrient mix or profile that it likes to grow in. <clears throat> and uh, that can be difficult if you're just doing media beds in a, an entire system. There's no separation there either. And that, that would be the other two, two things I would also bring up too, would be individual control. I can run three different strains and run three different nutrient profiles all, all together with the same main base. So they get the same 90% of it. And then we can fine tune that last little bit to, to perfect them on a per strain basis. The other one I would say is a huge advantage is pest management. Primarily, if you ever run into root aphids, uh, you can actually, you have a space for your nematodes to actually live near your root system uh, with the dual root zones. And you give a place for your rove beetles and other predators to actually live and colonize and not deal strictly with the aquatic environment. I have I've consulted on DWC cannabis grows that had root aphids and, you know, dealing with that tiny little layer at the bottom can be a complete nightmare. Uh, even with, you know, Bavaria Bazania and some of the other stuff that's out there, um, you know, and, and doing them a combos, whereas with the dual root zone, you know, if you have a nice layer where you can have predators living and happ happily all the time, it does, you know, we don't have those problems. Uh, once we switched everything over from over to the soil from the straight net cups, we were able to completely eliminate them where they had thrown everything in the kitchen sink at them before I got there. So, um, you know, this is uh, another advantage, I would say, both uh, from the nutrient end and from the IPM end. Uh, it gives you more options and more control. So, go ahead. Oh, one more time. So, I, I do have uh, like a number of different mixes that are going to be going into are that are in the dual root zone system right now so i have one because one question i get all the time is can you do just castings um you know why don't i just do just my my red worm stuff so um so people consistently want to know because they want to be sustainable right they want to think oh well why do i need all this extra stuff why can i just do red worms and so i did that i, I even got some from the store so i did a couple of different uh mixes in each bed um, with varying levels of potassium and phosphorus. And uh, so it, I do think that you can vary it a lot in the dual root zone and get um, you know, varied effects. So that's a, um, whether you're varying your levels for science and trying to dial in a strain to find out exactly what you want it to be. So <coughs> you're, you're running all the same, uh, you know, all the same cuts, but in um, different soils. So that's what I'm doing right now. I have about eight different clones of uh, Thorsberry that's all running in different nutrient mixes and different size pots, um, all with the same base castings. And then one that has just castings all by itself. So um, just, I think that kind of flexibility has value, not just for 
different strains or different that, but also for, for science, if you really want to dial a strain in, it allows you to have really multiple experiments happening in the same system at the same time, as opposed to just one, um, one nutrient profile for the entire system at once. If you wanted to replicate those results, you would have to have multiple small systems to test with to test as fast, because otherwise you're limited per run. You know, you can do like five tests a year, you can only progress so quickly, as opposed to, uh, you know, if you've got a hundred slots in your system, then you could run, in theory, a hundred different mixes uh, in the same way you run a hundred different uh, plants in a pheno to find out the best one. You could run a hundred different nutrient mixes in your soil layer to find out which one produced the absolute best. Now that might be extreme. You probably wouldn't run a hundred, but you could run, uh, you know, 10 different strains with 10 different profiles and that, you know, that becomes much more attractive to somebody trying to dial something in and, and figure out what you want to grow on a commercial level. So just running a test system, um, I think would be a huge value to even a place now that just did uh, DWC or whatever it was, because you would still have those nutrient levels that, you know, should have some sort of transport across growing types um, that you would be able to replicate even in your production system. So I think it has, Dual Root Zone has a, a lot of value just in its flexibility that we're only just starting to play with. Again, I think that just goes back to the the level of control that you get with it. You know, you 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 can dial in your aquatic zone with the fish and the fish water up until the point where the, it's a problem for the fish. You can play with your soil mixes. You can do a time release and do you could do no till. You could do living soil. You know, you can do straight hydronutrients if you want to go crazy. You could do PGRs and do it into the soil and it won't affect the fish. You know, if you want to go totally crazy, you have the option of of whatever you want. You have more knobs and more switches and more not you know sliders that you can change uh to dial it in and and again it just it allows you to really have the most uh most amount of choices when you're trying to decide well what do i add well if i need to add calcium i can add it in the upper part or in the lower part i could full your feed uh, so again it, it kind of gives you a wide range of options uh, as far as uh, uh, nutrient feeding and and and, and how you want to go about it be it organic non-organic natural input non-natural input or, or whatever yeah, I think I think the other option to it too is, uh, you know, controlling your nutrient, you know, from fish tank, you know, processed ready nutrient from fish tank into uh, a secondary secondary tank where you can have some tweaking there with with uh, you know, of course in our case you know organic certified you know you got to you know tweak your minerals uh, at that point uh, uh, some stuff you're just not going to get from your uh, fish feed dependent, right? So, so I, like, I, like to do, I like to do our tinkering on the, on the water side and like kind of go into it with the uh, uh, soil medium, either being living or not, you, you, you know what I mean? Even from a dual root, dual root zone perspective uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, as, as you know, you progress kind of down the, down the value chain, right? It's, it's uh, uh, you know, what, is, what, is, what does Quar look like um, when it takes up that microbial culture uh, of of your aquaponics water, uh, when you've got that that medium in play, uh, because that's unique, right? As well, and then uh, uh, and then you have uh, you know over over to the existing microbial culture in your living soil, uh, and and how how both of those uh, in, interact, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing you touched on was Kuar. Um, I would highly advise against Kuar and aquaponics. Um, the microbes in our aquaponics love to break down Kuar, and it'll, it'll get pretty mushy pretty quickly. Uh, we did a bunch of. I really, really, really wanted to use Kuar chips um, because of how they give a really good aeration and stuff for the roots, but man when we tested that, that that just turned into a nightmare we also did a whole four by four media bed where we just filled it up in place of of hydrogen with with uh, chips and uh, what happened was they'd float and go up and down and the plant would start off like at the top of the media and as, as it would flood and drain it would slowly go farther and farther down like quicksand until the plant just 
you know, almost disappeared into the into the media. So uh, it just uh, uh, again that with the cash, the cation exchange has been uh, at least in my personal testing has caused more problems than it has solved. Maybe maybe you've had a different experience. Well, well, I think I think you have to make sure you've got your irrigation match to the medium too, right? You know, like like you wouldn't want to be. Uh, you know, you wouldn't be in a bottom feed situation with with quar uh, like a, a nice cube, right? And and uh, you're you're more in a drip drip irrigate uh, scenario uh, there, right? So it's kind of. Uh, but I don't have the answer. I'm just letting you know we're just gonna look at it. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, there's only I know there was one company in Canada that was tinkering with it for a little bit, and then they ended up switching over more towards soil, but. Uh, I haven't yeah. spoken with them. Uh, I think it was a, a, a Quilitas or, or I'm not even sure what they're what they're up to these days. Yeah. I haven't spoken with them quite a while, but um, yeah, well, that's 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 a nice thing. Like where we're going to be looking at things. Like we'll have, you know, we'll end up with a couple a couple quar cubes. You know, after after we've got a stabilized strain over a few cycles in that room with the soil baseline, right? You know, you know, once we once we uh, whichever strain uh, you know hits a consistent flower number uh, the quickest right over a couple crop rotations then then we can you know put a couple things in have a look right you know do uh, uh you know throw in uh, throw in a little dwc you know do that do that comparison uh in a in a corner right uh but but i mean at the same time we have to make money so it's not just uh you know it's not just uh you know but but we but we designed we designed in you know, we did that, we built our facility with that in mind so we can segregate these little, you know, areas uh, in our, in our, during our flower cycles, right? That, that's definitely something else too I see people do with aquaponic systems is they, they'll buy one or they'll, they'll build one and then they want to experiment with their production system. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, build a side system yeah. for R&D. Don't ever experiment with your production and i see people do this all the time people call me and screw up whole systems or they list they hire a hydro guy who's dumping in the completely wrong iron or is dosing hydroxides or you know any number of completely crazy things that you should never are dosing with an oxide i saw someone <laughs> suggesting uh magnesium oxide for so for yeah. system well, that's cool, but it's immediately going to oxidize all your iron, right? So that's not, and, and iron is expensive because we use chelated iron, right? So, mm -hmm. so you got people that are throwing out all kinds of bad information out there uh, on aquaponics and, and, and just have these backwards ideas on the chemistry without any background in any of it. And, and or any experiment or, or any commercial experience that's another one you know I, I, and i'm sure you guys experience there's a ton of armchair experts in aquaponics and none of them have grown weed <laughs> but they'll tell you how to grow weed yeah um, and that's something else that's very common in aquaponics but that and again people experimenting with with their production systems i see it all the time and, and i don't understand it can you guys talk about like, for example, Tanner in New Brunswick, it, is there a difference or is it similar, the cultivars that grow well in aquaponics versus non-aquaponics environments in your local geography? Well, I mean, you know, every, every, like your friends who are down the road who are not growing aquaponics, are you yeah. guys noticing the same things? Or are you like, my experience is totally different with how this cultivar yields or grows or thrives or doesn't thrive? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> like there, there's uh, not a huge, not a huge network of aquaponics uh, growers to, uh, to, to reach out to. No, no, no. So, so I'm saying non aquaponics. Yeah. So, so are, are you see, are, are you see, like the cultivars that you see that work well in your environment, are they consistent with the cultivars that traditional farmers in your area are also seeing that grow well? Yeah. So we're, we're not actually, uh, testing a lot of local local cultivars uh to the uh to the region like everything everything we're running through our system uh is uh you know genetics that um you know we, we've kind of curated uh from uh, you know a lot of norcal is, <laughs> is is in there um so we're not uh we're we're we're, we're focused on some really really specific 
specific strains, right? Like our Royal Kush is a, is a huge focus of ours. Okay. Um, uh, looking at a Sky Cuddler, Sky Cuddler Kush, uh, Cherry West, uh, you know, so, so we're siphoning through a lot of stuff we can't really, really compare uh, to anyone local indoors, right? But, but this season, uh, our outdoor, uh, we, we, popped, we popped 200 seeds uh, about uh, uh, two, two and a half weeks ago here now. And, you know, we're going to be siphoning through what out of our library, you know, that we chose. We, we were aiming for a shorter, you know, shorter flower period. I mean, like this growing season could run until uh, mid-October, even November, you know, global warming. If global warming kind of like gives us, uh, gives us a gift. Uh, <laughs> we'll, kind of, we'll, we'll be able to go closer to uh, closer to Christmas. So, you know, one of the things that we're so excited about is that's 200 phenos. So uh, across about, you know, 35 strains roughly, or maybe 30 strains. And uh, we're really going to get a good idea of, uh, of what will perform really, really well here. So we're kind of going the other route, I guess, is, is we're going through our what we have that we love and uh, we think other people want to smoke uh, as well and that we want to smoke. And then we're also saying what works well in this region uh, that, uh, that, that then we can kind of bring into the, into the East coast community as well. So. Uh, I've found that um, indicas seem to seem to do slightly better than than sativas. Uh, that also could just be partially the fact that we're always growing in greenhouses or some other thing where we're we're mildly height restricted. Um, but uh, uh, in general, I've noticed that. I also noticed you know anything that's purple uh, or has a lot of of you know color to it seems to to express color more in the aquaponics. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'd say just like overall genetic expression i mean i don't know if you can really say that like it all tastes better or it all tastes you know like it just always tastes different i think that's one of the things that you can that you can say it you know objectively is uh, that they never ever taste the same and i i've had uh, you know a couple of local growers that i work with that do you know really big into living soil and human culture and um different k &F methods, you know, so they're really using the same inputs, just different uh, you know, growing methods. And, uh, you know, so we, we compare notes and exchange cuts and, um, you know, they just, they always taste different than what other people do or what I do in different medias. Um, you know, I, in my personal opinion, you know, it's definitely <laughs> always better you know, like there's never been a strain that I'm like, oh, you know what? I've really preferred it in uh, in living soil over aquaponics. So uh, I think I'm getting up to like 16 strains or something like that that I've grown in aquaponics now. So I don't know. That's a pretty good record. But um, I, I definitely <clears throat> can attest to the fact that it's different and that all the people that I have uh, allegedly smoked with have, have said the same thing that you can you can definitely taste the difference so um that's like the the main thing you know i think it'd be interesting to see like uh how it stacks up um, medicinally like i know there's been some research in different um, mushrooms that are effective as medicine but only when they feed off of certain type of food sources so i think it it would be interesting. I think Paul Stamets did uh, a lot of uh, statements, did a lot of research in uh, the effectiveness of mushrooms and its medicinal values, um, requiring it to be, uh, I think it was birch wood, a certain type of mushroom had to feed off of birch wood to have the type of medicinal effect. So, um, you know, are there, are there things, uh, applications specifically for aquaponic cannabis where the terpene pro profiles are going to more effectively treat certain medications uh, or, or certain uh, ailments, I guess, uh, I think is a fascinating question. 
I think I think eventually long term though, I think and especially this is something I've talked about and something that I've learned a lot just watching how how uh, the Humboldt community kind of came together to rally around their 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 selves as a brand, but I really think that Aquaponics almost could be almost like its own Appalachia because it, it's it, it's its own unique way. And with the the difference in the water pressure and how the plants regulate that and and how the plants biologically adapt to that over time, really does kind of create a different plant. And I think that you know collectively, if we all work together around that, we could all support each other that way. And and um, you know, and recognize it as a as a separate you know biome type uh, uh, to grow your cannabis. Uh, that that is a separate thing that has its own qualities and traits that can be marketable. Uh, you know, collectively as a as a group, and, and kind of taking the idea that you know um, uh, some of the the <laughs> the leaders like Kevin Jodry and some of the other people down in Humboldt have kind of taken that with the with the Humboldt Appalachia. But I really do think that, you know, if we're looking at this from a biological standpoint, aquaponics really kind of is its own little Appalachia or, or is, you know, maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it, but it's certainly that similar type of, of concept when it comes to uh, overall uh, changing the, 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 the way that the plant grows and, and it's, it's physiology in general. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think as a group, we definitely have a, great opportunity to firm it up as a, you know, a high quality category, right. Uh, within the, uh, uh, within the, uh, you know, craft craft and, and high end community. And that's all turf driven. And that's, uh, uh you know, it's uh, completely, completely quality driven. Right. So. So Steve, if you were to debate Frenchie cannoli about whether aquaponics deserves an appellation, uh, how would that conversation go? I think it would go pretty well. I know Frenchie has been begging me to actually make some aquaponic hash. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, when we get a, our good harvest here in the fall, uh, I can invite him out here to, to tell me myself if, uh, if it sucks or not. <laughs> He'll travel to Oklahoma. I, I would be happy to give Frenchie a couple of pounds to tell me, uh, uh, tell me what he thinks. So, so Kevin was actually uh, tuned in earlier. I'm assuming he he's gone since gone to bed, but <laughs> uh, it's it's ten o'clock West Coast time, uh, Tanner. That means what? It's one o'clock. Are are you in? You're not at home. You're like at the facility. I, I'm I'm at the office. It's it's yeah. I was gonna say that does not look like a home environment. A, a very <laughs> no, sterile no, it, corporate office back room with no windows do you have any yeah, windows just, no i got windows right in front of me just oh, okay of, yeah i'm staring through them that's that's the way to be pointed but yeah i've, I've this this tonight's tonight's talk's gonna have influence on my day tomorrow but i'll i'll, uh, I'll make it happen <laughs> right well apologize to the family for the uh <laughs> the 1 a.m end time uh steve are steve are you uh do you have any other questions comments or should we we call it a night no, I, I think we could wrap it up. Uh, I, I would like to uh, just mention if anyone's looking for additional aquaponic uh, cannabis content, Marty and I uh, host a, uh, a show once or twice a week, every week on, on that solely on that topic. We have over 400 hours of additional content if you want to learn more about that. And in fact, every single person that's been on this panel uh, tonight has had their own episode. So if you want to find out, in fact, uh, Leanne gave us a tour of his facility on video. It's quite very cool. Um, I have a, to a, a tour of organic innovations out here in Oklahoma. If you want to see that, Marty has tours of his facility. I, I know that uh, uh, Tanner's working on getting some footage up of his stuff. I'm not sure if he's posted that publicly or not, um, but it. I know that uh, uh, Bain's got some stuff up publicly. So if you want to see any of our content, you know, we, we have all that on there or check out their individual content as well. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's lots out there to explore. Actually, Marty, can, can you, uh, what you're commenting on on YouTube, can you just walk us through the star, the OG, the Lemon Kush, the Chernobyl? <coughs> oh, yeah. Shish, so Shishkaberry. Shishkaberry. Um, yeah, so I was just trying to name off somebody, you know, tried to call me out and ask if I could name all 16 strains that I have grown. And so I was trying to list all those off. So Starfighter OG, Lemon OG, Chernobyl, Kirkle, uh, Shiskaberry, Wi-Fi OG, Sour Strawberry, Mango Coast, Jack Hammer, Jack Hammer, uh, also Jack Hammer by Nine Pound Frost. 
I didn't put that one on the list yet. Uh, <clears throat> blackberry frost, pineapple by banana frost, Thor's berry, blue cheese, snowman. I think I'm up to like 14 or 15 now. I'm getting close. That's all I got off the top of my head, though. Blue cheese is great. It's like one of my favorites, for sure. It was uh, my first run of outdoor. You can see aquaponic blue cheese on my YouTube channel at AP Meds. Most of those strains are documented on my YouTube grow. So you can definitely check those out. Yeah, and I know a couple of us too have, have facility builds. I know I have some on my channel, Marty does on his. Uh, I know uh, some of these guys as well have, have build videos as well, so check those out. Um, also, uh, someone else mentioned in chat, I almost forgot, um, we have the Aquaponic Cannabis a Facebook group. Uh, it's uh, facebook.com slash groups slash AP Canna, uh, if you're looking to join. Uh, we have a huge group, over 7,000 people from around the world. We actually have quite a few people there now from South Africa as well. So. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are on the planet. I actually knew someone in, in Zimbabwe when I landed that actually was from my Facebook group. So you never know uh, uh, where you'll find some cool people uh, to hang out with and uh, to get a get a J from when you're when you're on your travels. Uh, and it's a great group <laughs> great. that yeah, supports each group. other in, in, in a non-toxic way too. It's uh, aquaponic cannabis growers if you're just searching that. And uh, yeah, it's a great place. Steve and I and a couple other monitor it pretty heavily for the usual trollness. So, um, yeah, come and share and learn if you want to know about aquaponic cannabis growing. It's a ton of information already there, stuff that you can search through, and uh, people post their stuff and get their questions answered on a, on a regular basis. So. But we also have a lot of resources in the file section too, if you're looking for help with individual things, uh, different Excel sheets and things that can help you out as well with your grow. Sure. I just want to say, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Slice. Thank you. I'm so late over there. It'll be a sick day tomorrow. <laughs> what was that? What was the name of your farm and, again for the person and, out and there? I'm... What's that? Go ahead. Oh, so uh, yeah, Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Farms. Just gave it my last name. Wasn't very creative. <laughs> yeah, no. So Stuart Vertical Farms. Uh, we're at a at a Saint Stephen, New Brunswick. But uh, uh, yeah, and we're just you know happy to be part of this uh, aquaponics community. Peter, thanks for having me. I thought you were just like telling people what you did, like Stuart Farms. Like it's a it's like a bird, right? That's oh yeah, it is, yeah. Stuart yeah. Stuart Farms. It's a we farm yeah. aquaponically. It's a, yeah, foregone conclusion. Stuart, Stuart farms aquaponically. That's right. <laughs> we're Stuart, we're farming things. That's what we do. <laughs> right. Appreciate your time, sir. All right, guys. All right. Well, Steve, thank Steve, thanks for uh, putting it together and and rallying the crew. I appreciate it. It was. <laughs> it's rare that I get to just sit back and relax and just watch. So. Uh, Thanks again. And to everybody who's watching, uh, thanks for tuning in till 10 p.m. Pacific time, 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And on that, let's call it a night. Thanks for having us. I appreciate you just giving on the platform to educate people on aquaponics. No problem.